and real life. A very good evening and a hearty welcome to the session of the second lecture series of the Center for Studies in Gender, Culture and Media on Rereading Sustainability. Uh, may I whoever is keeping the audio open to kind of switch off the audio? There is a buzz going on in the background. Yes, thank you. Uh, today we present a cluster of talks on the subtopic sustaining the historical past. This event is a little different in nature, along with our esteemed guest speaker. It comprises papers of research scholar and PG students who have shown interest in participating. We will open the platform to students for future participations with the objective of engaging them beyond the boundaries of their curriculum and to make them think out of the predictable patterns of questions and answers that mostly preoccupy them. This program will be conducted by Dr. Sneha Kochoudhury. So over to Sneha. Thank you, Chandravadi. Uh, I would now like to start with our first speaker and introduce him. Uh, he's our colleague, uh, Dr. Oniban Sharkar. He took his graduate degree in commerce from the University of Calcutta and obtained certificate of merit and also received national scholarship from government of India. He took his master's degree in commerce from the University of Calcutta and secured rank in the first class. He obtained his MPhil degree from the same university by submitting his MPhil dissertation on emergence of Euro and its study implications for India, uh, which was a study and secured first rank in the first class. He also obtained his PhD from the same university on the thesis entitled Globalization and the Behavior of Foreign Direct Investment in India. He obtained his postgraduate diploma in business management from IMT Ghaziabad with specialization major in finance and minor in marketing and secured first division. He chaired, co-chaired, and presented papers in many national and international conferences. He also acted as resource persons in various workshops and research programs conducted by universities and institutes of national importance across different states in India. He has also published many papers in ABDC, Scopus, SCI, Web of Science, and UGC Care enlisted journals, and in edited books published by foreign publishers of repute like Rutledge, Emerald, Palgrave Macmillan, Bloomsbury, and others in the areas of general management, marketing, economics, and finance. He has served as the State Public Information Officer, SPIO, of our university, West Bengal State University, from 2012 to 2016. At present, he is serving uh, West Bengal State University as an Assistant Professor of uh, the Department of Commerce and Management and is also the convener of the Sports Board of the University, additional charge from 2016. He is a life member of the Indian Economic Association, Bengal Economic Association, Indian Accounting Association, and Indian Commerce Association. He is presently holding the position of Executive Council member of Indian Economic Association and also Program Coordinator of Eastern Region in IEA. His talk today is entitled Sustainability and Dark Tourism, a Historical Perspective. Now I request Dr. Shorka to start his presentation. Thank you. So very good evening to all the members present. Uh, I am audible, I think. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. So a uh, very warm and wonderful uh, introduction which i don't deserve i think from snehadi uh, so thank you to sneha madam and uh, i will fail in my duty if i don't uh, congratulate uh, the head of the department of english chandrava chakraborty as well as director of the center for studies in gender culture and media so I am grateful that I have been uh, given the chance to speak uh, as one of the speaker in the cluster of talks 
on sustaining the historical past. I also uh, congratulate all the members of this center as well as all my colleagues in the English department uh, for giving me the chance uh, to uh, share my thoughts on the topic which I'm going to discuss on sustaining sustainability and dark tourism historical perspective. So before going to my presentation, uh, let us, we know that we are actually in this pandemic and we are, uh, my screen is visible. Yes, it is visible. Yeah. Oh, okay. So before starting my presentation, uh, let us start with a prayer to Almighty. So, Om, lead us from unreal to real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. So, in this pandemic, uh, we are facing the dark side of the nature. So, I thought that it will be pertinent to discuss dark tourism in this context because we know that tourism is actually a field where we travel for fun and frolic and for our leisure as well. But nowadays, due to this pandemic, this tourism industry has got a hard hit. And to talk about tourism in this perspective, I think dark tourism is the most popular and most important in this present scenario. So before going into details about this dark tourism and sustainability and remembering the historical past of these dark tourists or for that matter dark tourist spots let us uh, start with a audio visual presentation to just get a highlight about what do we mean by dark tourism Auschwitz, the Berlin Wall, Chernobyl. Once sites of tragedy have now become popular tourist destinations. These places have histories of war, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and mass murder. Despite their tragic history, the number of tourists visiting these sites has increased drastically over the years. So what is it about tragedy and despair that fascinates the human mind? Visitors have varied experiences of these sites. Some are fascinated by the tragic events and want to immerse themselves in these spaces. Arguing that actually being there can invoke much stronger feelings than a textbook possibly could. Others visit to seem daring or adventurous on their social media handles. Some visit for religious reasons. Tourists have visited Christ's crucifixion site in Jerusalem ever since the 11th century. Dark tourism can be a grim experience, but those seeking thrill engage in extreme forms. Dedicated dark tourists have chosen to travel war sites in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. Smiling selfies have poured out of war zones, prompting many to question the morality and ethics behind visiting such sites. A more immersive experience, religion, thrill, reverence, whatever the reasons may be, dark tourism remains a lucrative industry. So we have got a glimpse of what is dark tourism. Now we need to try to find out a link between sustainability and dark tourism. 
so let us start with sustainability now what do we mean by sustainability actually there are three pillars of sustainability to they are economic environmental and social when we talk about economic sustainability that is from organization perspective we think about how to gain profits from environmental sustainability we think about how to save our planet and from social sustainability we think of how to generate welfare of the people so sustainability we can say that it should focus on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the need of our future generation therefore conservation of water and other resources is very important so in this perspective we now try to define what is tourism because we tr we are trying to relate sustainability with tourism so what is tourism tourism actually encompasses those activities which a person tries for traveling and staying in places outside their usual environment and if they are striving for traveling and staying say for more than one year for leisure business or other purpose then we cannot say that it is tourism so actually tourism means activities of persons traveling and staying in places outside their usual environment but for not more than one year so it should be less than one year the purpose may be leisure may be business or maybe for fun or other activities now tourism actually is of two types one is international tourism when people visit a foreign country it is referred to as international tourism when we are traveling within our country we call it as domestic tourism now how we can relate tourism with sustainability so we are talking about sustainable tourism here actually sustainable tourism means that we should minimize our cost and maximize the benefits of tourism towards natural environments and local communities so that without harming any resources we can generate benefits to the local communities we can generate benefits to the natural environment so sustainable tourism ensures that future generations can enjoy the beauty of our planet as much as we are doing now so basically three measures are being taken for sustainable tourism development one is sustainable business practice second is community development third is third is environmental stewardship so we will try to be responsible respectful towards our environment so that for our tourism purpose we don't harm the environment we should look after the tourist spots and the community there the local people staying there and we should come up with certain sustainable business practices that actually generates revenue and livelihood for the community at large now what is dark tourism let us try to go in detail because this is our focus of discussion today so actually dark tourism has many facets there is tragedy tourism there is warfare tourism there is genocide tourism there is extreme tourism there is horror tourism there is grief tourism there is hardship tourism now when when we call it as dark tourism dark tourism actually relates travel for the which is related to death which is related to genocide which is related to horror which is related to tragedy and we human beings we are fascinated with tragedy we always have a curiosity towards the dark side of everything so the attraction of death and disaster actually motivates us to visit places like iraq syria lebanon 
and we visit those sites where death and disasters have occurred in the past, like we know Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar, where if we go now, we will find bullets in the wall. Then there is macabre, which involves death or violence in a way that is strange, frightening and unpleasant. We will talk about Auschwitz in Poland. Then there are memorable sites which actually helps us to remember remember our historical past like Rajghat in New Delhi. So there are certain tourist spots which are dark tourist spots in the sense it may be real, it may be symbolic, it may be memorial. So we visit those places because we are attracted towards those places. Now, we are very well aware that in the past and in the current scenario also, before the pandemic, there was growth of dark tourism. Dark tourism was actually becoming popular day by day. Now, what are the reasons for this? One is memorialization unifies people under a commonality. We know that uh, the incident which took place in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear bombing. There is a Hiroshima peace memorial. So one who visits Japan, visit this place. Then tourists create their own interpretations as well of the historical events in the past. Like I will talk in detail about the Bhanga Fort in Rajasthan. Then there may be a cause of morbidity appeal. So certain individuals have formed memories of visiting places of memorials like Indira Gandhi Memorial, like Rajghat in New Delhi. Then there are sites of war. There are sites of atrocities which has historical interest like battlefield of Waterloo in Belgium. Then their appeal of heritage outside the possible morbid appeal, like I will talk about the Jahar Kund of Chitor Fort in Chitor. So these are the reasons, the memorialization, the tourist own interpretations, the morbidity appeals, sites of war atrocity, appeal of heritage, all these are reasons for growth of dark tourism. Now, if we want to understand the impact of dark tourism on four parameters, that is economic, environmental, social and cultural, we will see that there are both positive as well as negative impact. If we talk about the economic parameter or the economic impact of dark tourism, we find that these depleted areas have certain things which actually is helping them to generate revenue. But it is of limited nature. Why? Because the negative impact is th that only a handful of tourists is going to these places. So the limited revenue generation is there. If these tourist spots become much more popular, if visitors go there, then there will be more scope of earning revenue and maintenance of those historical sites, which may be dark in nature. Now, if we talk about the environmental impact, we understand there, there is existing infrastructure there in those dark spots. There is no need of any new construction. So if we can protect our fragile environment, if we can uh, recreate or reinstate those historical events, then we can save those dark tourist spots in the term of environment. Now, there are negative impacts as well because if the visitors go there, since there is a fragile environment, the environment, if 
the visitors don't understand the sanctity of those environment and if they create environmental footprints then there will be a negative impact if we talk about the social impact we understand that we should remember our historical past in true sense we should not be confused with false narratives because these sites brings awareness towards the violence and tragedy that occurred in the past so it actually creates opportunity for the tourists to become educated to remember the historical past to understand the quality of life and how to stop these tragedies but certain potential negative impressions are there because when you visit these sites you feel depressed the cultural impact is that if you have understood certain places or certain histories about the places in negative terms if you go there if you visit there if you understand the commonality of the communities there then you will be in a position to appreciate the cultural heritage in those places now the problem or the negative side of this cultural impact is that if you cannot mix with the local people if you cannot share the empathy and the distress of the local people they will not be in a position to disclose those tragic events and they will not be in a posi position to share their emotions with you so now we come to discuss about the current trends in dark tourism historically many people we think that they are fascinated with death and tragedies and there are little dark secrets behind this dark tourist spots or places which creates confusions and ambiguities and whatever dark side whatever dark aspects maybe novel maybe film maybe crime book we are very fond of we are very attracted towards those and therefore dark tourism is a concept which will gather momentum in future days to come now we will talk about certain dark tourist spots both in india as well as abroad just to remember the historical past of those events which took place so let us start with jallianwala bagh massacre in amritsar we know that in 1919 on 13th april the then british government and the then british brigadier general general dyer actually ordered the troops of his army to fire the unarmed civilians who were actually gathered at jallianwala bagh this is a public garden we know which is walled on all the five sides i have personally visited this site and i was mesmerized looking at these destructive sites where still you will find the bullets hanging in the walls and the government the punjab government they have taken steps to actually maintain this site next we will be talking about roopkund in uttarakhand you know that this is a skeleton lake which is at a high altitude of 16470 feet in the himalayas and this is a glacial lake in uttarakhand and we find that this kund is 3 meters in depth and at the surrounding edge of the lake you will find lots of hundreds of ancient human skeletons and history reveals that 
group of people were killed in a sudden violent hail storm in the 9th century there and therefore still the trekkers who visit these places they find lots of skeletons around these places which gives a horror like thrilling next we talk about the cellular jail the popular known as kalapani which is in andaram andaman and nicobar island you know that the exiling political prisoners were deported there in the prison and the independence activists like botukeshwar dotto priti lata wadedar shiv varma shubod rai ambika chakraborty yogendra shukla chidambaram pillai kalpana dotto they were imprisoned during the struggle for indian independence in those cellular jails and today if you visit there you will find the complex serving as national memorial monument if you think of rajghat this is a symbolic dark tourist spot you know that mahatma gandhi the father of the nation was cremated there this is located between the main ring road which is known now as mahatma gandhi road which is in the banks of jamuna river and rajghat is very well surrounded by lovely exotic trees which creates a very serene ambiance and the mortal remains of mahatma gandhi were cremated at this ghat so this is a place where indians if they visit delhi they actually don't miss to visit this place we again talk about another dark to spot which is vaga border we most of us has went uh, went there we understand that there is a symbolic representation of anger and mimicry uh, between india and pakistan and that flavor comes when we visit this vaga border and when we see the flag wasting ceremony and this is another place which is gaining very popular very much popularity for the tourists you will be remembering this tragedy that is bhopal gas tragedy which occurred during 1984 at union carbide plant in bhopal madhya pradesh we know that 5 lakh people around died there and 40 tons of methyl isocyanide gas actually caused this damage and according to government records uh we see that this is a tragic place and this is gaining popularity as dark tourism destination in india now now you know that uh, taj mahal is uh, one of the seven wonders of the world and it has been uh, awarded the unesco world heritage site uh, many people visit there but they don't understand the tragedy of this place you will you are well aware that uh, below this taj mahal shah jahan's wife mumtaz grave is there and those workers who have actually built this heritage site actually their thumbs were chopped off so that they cannot recreate this magic so there is a pain there is a grave incident behind this historic site so this is also being popularized as dark tourism destination you know that 
Kargil war took place and now in Jammu and Kashmir, in Kargil, a Kargil war memorial has been erected. And if you see the picture, you will understand that this is built in pink sandstone and the commemorates of the soldiers who have died in the Kargil war, they are being commemorated here. Not only that, this memorial stands proudly by the side of the main highway which goes from Srinagar to Leh and this has become a very popular dark tourism destination for Indian tourists now. Those who visit Kashmir, they visit this place, this Kargil War Memorial. Now, many of you can remember the Chitor Fort in Rajasthan, which has a historical past. You know that Alauddin Khilji actually invaded this Chitor to capture Rani Padmavati and Rani with their entire followers of women performed Johar that is mass self-immolation. This is a very tragic event. And this is also, this Chitor Fort is also gaining popularity nowadays as a dark tourism destination. Another fort, which is called the Bhangar Fort in Rajasthan, this is also gaining popularity as a dark tourism destination now. It was built by uh, the King Bhagwan Das for his younger son Madhu Singh. And this Bhangar Fort is located at the border of the Sariska Reserve in the Aravali Range in the Alwar district of Rajasthan. And the tale goes like there was a wizard named Sinhai who fall in love with the princess Ratnavati and the wizard actually offered her a love potion which she refused and which she threw into a large rock and which actually made the wizard face death. So this is another tragic historical event which took place in Bhangar Fort. And therefore, people or tourists, after remembering the historical past or awareness about the historical events, they are visiting these places. And this place is gaining popularity as a dark tourism destination. Now, if we look abroad, if we look at the international dark tourist spots. The most important dark tourism destination spot is Chernobyl in Ukraine. You know that in 1986, due to an explosion, actually this was a nuclear explosion, uh, explosion this which took place and which actually killed thousands of people there and the explosion was so massive that it has impacted around about 30 kilometers around the plant and this is a very popular spot those who visit russia they visit this chernobyl plant in ukraine and uh, in 2019 team Around 2 lakh visitors visited this Ukraine Chernobyl and this has been awarded as the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It got status and the minister there in Ukraine, the cultural minister think that this World Heritage status of Chernobyl will actually help the site to 
gain much more popularity among the tourists. This is another symbolic dark tourism destination we call Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. So to honor Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of United States, this memorial was erected. And this memorial symbolizes belief in freedom and dignity of the people that Lincoln actually popularized. And around 6 million people visits this memorial yearly. And this memorial actually is one of America's beloved shrines. So this is a symbolic site which is gaining popularity as a dark tourism destination. Next, we come to this Hiroshima Peace Memorial in Japan. You know the history that during World War II, the nuclear bombing took place in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in that spot, this Hiroshima Peace Memorial has been erected, which is also called the Atomic Bomb Dome. And it also got the UNESCO World Heritage Site status in 1996. And in that Hiroshima event on 6th August 1945, around 1,40,000 people died. And therefore, this peace memorial actually is a memoir and a tribute to those people who lost their lives. In this event. Now, if you think about this place, this is the Tower of London. This is a 900 year old castle and fortress in central London. And within this castle, you will find many crown jewels and many famous and infamous prisoners uh, were uh, there in this place. And there are lots of stories about the royal tragedy and death which took place in the Tower of London. During the War of Roses, Henry VI was murdered here in 1471. And the children of Henry VI, that is great Edward IV and the princes of the royal family, actually was murdered here as well. Now, this is another very popular dark tourism destination, which is called the Auschwitz camp in Poland. You know that the Germans, they attacked Poland in World War II and imprisoned the Polish political prisoners there. They were deported to this camp. This is the concentration camp in Poland, which is called Auschwitz. And six million Jewish people died in this camp due to Nazi Germany's attack and exploitation. So this is a very popular place now as dark tourism destination. We all know about the titanic tragic event in Atlantic Ocean. If you see the picture, you will find that the wreck is still visible. It is at a depth of about 12,500 feet below the sea level and the remains are still there which sank in 1912 and the bow part of this ship is still 
recognizable and this is another very symbolic dark tourism destination in the atlantic ocean we are well aware of the world trade center or the twin towers in new york which got demolished by al qaeda attacks in september 11 2001 in the in this twin tower place a memorial has been erected which is called as the reflecting absence honors which actually honors the victims of the september 11 attacks and now a memorial has been erected there which is surrounded by pools of water and if you visit there you will find that the names of the victims are encrypted there in that memorial space this is another uh, popular dark tourism spot which is called the killing fields of cambodia this is the chiang ek actually the kill took place between 1975 and 1979 in cambodia and there are around 300 killing fields scattered in cambodia but out of those 300 killing fields this chiang ek or the nom phen which is popularly called is the most popular and it was hard that around 17000 people were murdered in, the, in this killing field and if you see the picture you will find that the memorial site has one stupa which is in the right right side and within the stupa you will find the stupa filled with skill uh, with uh, skulls and bones of over 8000 victims which got killed in this battlefield so in cambodia this phenom or chiang ek is gaining popularity as a dark tourism destination if you visit the nepali or the uh, nepali part of italy which is in the campania region you will find this pompeii which is a vast archaeological site and it was a roman city which got ruined due to mount vesuvius eruption in 79 ad and if you visit there you will find the streets the houses still there and around 2000 people died in pompeii due to eruption of mount vesuvius and it is recorded that around 16000 people died in this event so pompeii is also a very popular dark tourism site which many tourists visit when they visit italy i will finish uh, the instances with the bone chart which is the sedlec ossuary you know that in czech republic uh, if you see the picture you will find that around 40 to 70 40000 to 70000 skeletons you will find and there are bones there which is being decorated and furnished in the chapel and this is the most visited tourist attraction of czech republic and it attracts around 2 lakh visitors annually this is again a symbolic dark tourism destination 
which is gaining popularity recently. So till now it is okay. I am audible, I think. Yes. Yes, you are audible. Yes. Okay. So now question comes to our mind that whether dark tourism is ethical or unethical. So I think or I place it in this way that yes, it is ethical if we support the local economies there, if revenue is generated. Yeah, bolo. Bolo. Yeah, I am audible, I think. Oh, what is it? Shabbunash. Streaming time on the program. The program to who is Neha, you have to mute yourself. Oh, sorry. I will continue. Yes, I think, Anirvan. Please continue. You continue. Okay. Please continue. Okay, okay. So, uh, I pose a question that whether dark tourism is ethical or unethical. Yes, it will be ethical. If the tourists who are visiting those places, they support the local e economy, if they are respectful towards the communities there, if they are respect to, uh, respectful towards the historical tragic events, then a lot of revenues can be generated from these tourists. And it also creates awareness and education among the tourists about these historical events. And if the local authorities there, they charge some tickets for entering these places, then the revenue generated from these tickets or gen revenue generated from memoirs, souvenirs will help to preserve the these historical sites. Now, it may be unethical if it may be it, it is ethical if it supports local economies if it raises awareness among the tourists if, if it provides education about the historical past now it may be unethical also when it becomes unethical dark tourism become unethical if the tourists are not aware of the surroundings, if they don't understand the history, if they visit these places for wrong reasons, if they are disrespect disrespectful towards those sites, if they talk negative narratives or ill about those sites, Nowadays, generations are very fond of selfies. In these places, you should avoid taking selfies. You should understand the spirit, the tragedy, the catastrophe of these historical events which took place. If you understand this, then it becomes ethical. If you don't understand, if you don't appreciate, it becomes unethical. Not only that, it becomes unethical if you visit those staff to spots, which is unsafe, which is unhealthy. And if you create some wrong environmental footprints, then it becomes unethical. So I will conclude with certain observations that we are in a situation in this pandemic where we understand that there are 
populist politics going on there is terrorism there is climate change there is natural disaster there is man made disasters and we are living in a society where we are using social media we are abbreviated with news feeds which are more fake than real we are facing increasing economic uncertainty we are also going through this electoral claims that we have seen in bengal politics in few days ago so in this backdrop in this pandemic which is going on we feel that we have to provide some documentary historical records we have to preserve those and we should avoid selective interpretation we should also be aware of the negative side of the story and nowadays truth has become a commodity so if you want to commodify if you want to maintain the relevance then you have to understand and remember the historical past and the events and therefore we think that dark tourism has become popular has become a niche interest thing and people are significantly fascinated with this dark past and tragic histories so we need to sell the historical past ethically if we want to sell it if we want to package it then i think there should be a interface between history ideology and relevance of tourism and in order to understand this authentic experience which we have shared with with the help of this dark tourism spots in contrast to the simulated or virtual alternatives that we are facing through social media it is very important for us to offer this dark tourism destination as a viable alternative and to promote this in right context so i have actually uh, finished my deliberation i will finish this off with a podcast i i think i am audible yes yes you are audible so i will uh, request all the members uh, present to hear this podcast very sincerely and try to find out the answer to the quiz which is shared in this podcast this is 6 minutes english from bbc learning english.com Welcome to 6 Minute English. I'm Rob and I'm Neil. Hello. Today we're talking about an unusual type of tourism. Now tourism is the business of providing services such as transport or places to stay or entertainment for people who are on holiday. But instead of providing sunny holidays in a nice hotel by the sea, this is where tourists travel to sites of death, brutality and terror. It's being called dark tourism. Rob, have you ever been to any dark tour destination or place? Yes, I visited Auschwitz in Poland. A fascinating trip, but an obviously depressing place. And next month, I'm planning to go to visit Chernobyl, the site of a catastrophic nuclear accident back in 1986. So these are not your typical sightseeing trips, but a visit to places that make you curious because of their significance, their importance in history. Mm, exactly. 
We'll talk more about this soon, but not before I set you today's question. Now, Robin Island in South Africa is one dark tourism destination. It's where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for 18 years. But do you know in which year it finally closed as a prison? Was it in A, 1991, B, 1996, or C, 1999? I don't know, but I am going to guess A, 1991, because I think he was released in 89, and surely they would have shut it down pretty quickly after that. Well, I like your thinking. Uh, I'll really answer later on. So let's talk more about dark tourism. The word dark is used here because it relates to places that are connected with bad or sinister things or things that could be considered morally wrong. It's strange to want to visit places like these. There is what we call a morbid fascination. That's showing an interest in things connected with death and destruction. And these kinds of trips are on the increase. Yes, there are organised tours to places like Ground Zero in New York, the Killing Fields in Cambodia, and the nuclear power station in Chernobyl. And there are the battlefields of World War I and II, and the top security prison of Alcatraz. There are also plans to turn the disaster site of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan into a tourist destination once the radiation is reduced. But why do people want to visit these macabre sites? Well, I mentioned curiosity and a chance to learn about history, but sometimes people just feel compelled to visit them. But what about the ethics of dark tourism? Is it wrong to make this trip? Are we not just exploiting or making money or cashing in on someone's suffering? Dr. Philip Stone is an expert in the subject. He's director of the Institute for Dark Tourism Research. He says this type of tourism isn't new. People have been visiting these types of places for years. He says it's always been there. It's not new in the sense that we, we are fascinated by um, other death and uh, the people's uh, suffering, um, but it's, it's how it's, it's packaged up by the, the tourist industry. So, he says, dark tourism isn't new. In fact, a medieval execution was an early form of dark tourism. Maybe it's just human nature that draws us to these places. Dr. Stone says it's all about how these dark trips are packaged. So it depends how they're sold and how tasteful they are. Are they sensitive to the horrors of what has taken place? Yes, being able to walk around a historic site or visit a museum is one thing. But how about staying in a former prison in Latvia and paying to be treated like a prisoner? Or how about crawling around Vietnamese war tunnels whilst people fire guns outside? Mm, maybe that's taking the experience too far. Dr. Stone says there's a blurred line between memorialization and tourism. He means it's hard to separate going to remember an event and the people who've died with visiting somewhere as part of a holiday. Another issue when visiting these places is how you remember your visit. You must be respectful. Perhaps taking photos, yes, but should you take a selfie? Mm. And should you buy a souvenir or send a postcard home? Yes, well, you certainly wouldn't write on your postcard, wish you were here. Anyway, let's now reveal the answer to the question I set you earlier. Yes, this was about the former prison on Robben Island, which is now a popular destination for dark tourism. I asked you when it finally closed as a prison. Was it in A, 1991, B, 1996, or C, 1999? And I said A, 1991. And you were wrong, actually. It was in 1996. About 350,000 people now visit the site every year, which shows how much interest there is in a place that you would have once never wanted to go near. Is it somewhere you would like to visit, uh, Neil? Uh, I'm not so sure about dark tourism, to be honest. OK, well, could you instead remind us of the vocabulary that we've heard today? Yes, we heard tourism, depressing, catastrophic, curious, morally wrong, morbid fascination, macabre, compelled, ethics, exploiting, human nature, tasteful, memorialization, respectful. Thanks, Neil. Well, we hope you've enjoyed today's program. Please join us again soon. Thank you for patient hearing. 
I stop my presentation now. So okay, I am. Thank open you, to... Dr. Shortka. Yeah. I am open to questions or comments or observations. Yeah. Okay. I think if Chandravati has a question. Uh, no, I mean, shall I take questions now? Because the weather is inclement and uh, our organizers who are actually organizing this, they are facing power cuts and other kinds of technical issues. So I think we carry on with the papers and at the end of it, we take the questions so that every the, those who, have, who are present for, uh, who are there for presentation can, uh, can present. Yes. Okay. Okay. I guess. Okay. okay. No. Uh, so, by uh, thanking Dr. Shorkar for this very perceptive and informative presentation, we move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Namrata Choudhury, who is Assistant Professor of St. Xavier's College. And she's also a PhD scholar at the West Bengal State University Department of English. Her presentation is entitled Sustaining the Historic Past of Park Street. So now I request uh, Namrata Choudhury to start her presentation. Um, thank you very much, ma'am. So um, I'll be sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? It is visible, yeah. Oh, thank you, ma'am. So um, I shall start but now. The yeah. yeah. Is there a problem? Namrata, carry on. No, it's there's okay. no problem. You can okay. carry on, carry on. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is titled Sustaining the Historic Past of um, Park Street. And um, I'll be taking the help of a film very specific, Korosthane Shabdhan, and um, I'll try to elaborate on the concept of uh, sustainability. So um, just before I go into a discussion, I'd like to uh, take a minute here and talk about this. So um, this is the 2010 film by Shondeep Rai based on um, the book by Shotajit Rai, which has got um, his detective or sleuth, um, Pradosh C. Mitter or Pradosh Chandramitra, a.k.a. Feluda, to the initiated and to the uninitiated, um, who goes on to solve another mystery, this time not traveling uh, to a, a location abroad or, um, sorry, uh, outside of uh, Kolkata, but rather in uh, the city itself. So this will take us to Park Street and uh, to something very specific, which is South Park Street Cemetery. So that's where the discussion will um, head on to. Uh, the previous speaker, Professor Shorkar, uh, spoke about the pillars or the models of sustainability. So um, I'll just spend um, minimum time on this, but I'd still want to say that um, in the initial phase with the 2002 um, World Summit on Sustainable Development, um, there were three specific areas to focus on ecological social and economic. But increasingly, the cultural, the idea of cultural, uh, cultural sustainability has come into focus and there have been varied um, ways of interpretation. So when I say varied ways of interpretation, there has been a section which focuses on eco-criticism and um, its connection to literature, eco-dystopias and um, a variety of texts. But there's also something else beyond um, just the intersection of eco-criticism and literary text per se. So um, in this particular reading of um, Gorosthane Shabdhan, I shall focus on culture, sustainability, and heritage. So um, as, as I move on, what I want to focus on today is, um, is, is this question of um, cultural memory of heritage and what it means to us and how cultural sustainability as it is can be a little bit different from other forms of sustainability. Um, when I say other forms, I mean the social, economic and as well as um, ecological or environmental concerns in there. So primarily, um, is this just the fourth pillar 
just the additional fourth leg added onto the three previous um, existing legs? Or can this be uh, something beyond the additional? So I'll go forward with this idea. It's beyond the additional um, fourth pillar because um, this is this kind of provides a framework which is um, the basis of uh, newer research policies and um, research um, you know, areas of um, research. And it kind of permeates into the other three pillars as well. So it's not something um, which is exclusive, but it, it is kind of um, woven around all the other threes as well. So um, if I take a look at the uh, 2015 Rutledge book, and um, there are three quotes from the introduction here. So this is specifically about heritage. And um, as I go through bits and pieces of, from the introduction that I have put on um, the next slide and this one as well. So um, we would be able to establish how cultural sustainability is a little different from the other three. So heritage often perceived simplistically as protecting the past or even saving or rescuing it is in fact as complex and elusive to define as are the words culture and sustainability. So right from uh, the very first statement here, I think we can, uh, we, we can distinguish because with the general understanding of sustainability, this is oriented towards the future, but with cultural uh, sustainability, um, it, it needs to take the past into account. And thus it would kind of deal with questions um, regarding uh, cultural memory, cultural heritage, and um, institutions such as archives, um, libraries, museums. Um, and, and, and these you know, libraries, archives, and museums, these kind of become the vessels of um, conservation, which kind of help uh, in the in the process of transmission, in the process of transfer of knowledge, of um, cultural information from um, one generation to another. So um, cultural sustainability for this um, presentation of mine would focus on the past and not on uh, resources and how they are um, you know, preserved for future generations. Both culture and heritage are less any particular set of outcomes than continual processes of remaking firmly rooted in social construction in individual and collective perception and in their specificities of time and place. And also read the third one here. Heritage is central thread of sustainability, not only as an issue of preservation, but of creation, adaptation, and resilience to change. So when we talk about um, cultural uh, sustainability and specifically about when using the term heritage, well, um, there is a certain specificity of time and place as um, pronounced in the court. But then again, the perception to it by researchers, by scholars would evolve with time. So um, that's exactly what we're looking forward to into the text. Heritage is ultimately being about intergenerational transfer and about the present day as a bridge from past to future. Heritage, like cultural action, is rooted in space as well as time and is consequently more often than not place-based, site-specific, locality-sensitive, and community-contextualized. It is this everyday aspect and use that makes heritage buildings, places, townscapes, landscapes a key component of social and cultural sustainability. I believe um, location specific, site specific was also the focus in the previous presentation. And here too, if you take a look at um, the title that I have given to the slide. So um, yes, this is um, locality specific, but you can see when we talk about time, you can see a certain transfer going on. So previously um, it was Burial Ground Road, then it was renamed into Park Street and um, the present times that we are living in, it is again renamed as Mother Teresa Sharani. So um, with these changes, um, the focus keeps changing. But again, uh, we would take a look at uh, how these, um, 
how Shundi Pry presented the South Park Street Cemetery in um, the film. So these are, uh, this is the poster for the film and this is a book cover. So um, for both of these, we have um, these monuments prefiguring into the text. Um, stepping into the film, there are multiple visits to the South Park Street Cemetery, sometimes in the dead of the night and sometimes in the daylight. And um, the problem, because this is a detective story, we have um, the sleuth, the main character, along with um, his friends trying to solve a mystery. So the mystery starts, gives um, its genesis is in the South Park Street Cemetery. So uh, the picture on my left to my left corner is um, the one where you see grave diggers. And um, we come to know later on that they had been digging around one particular grave. The picture on my right, um, this activity, this nocturnal activity takes place on a stormy night. And um, you can see a report on the TV screen right the next morning where um, you know branches have um, fallen um, and um, there, uh, there's been a considerable loss in the cemetery in Park Street. And initially the mystery kind of starts with um, there being a report that a person has been harmed because of a broken branch, but that's actually not true. So there on, um, the detective needs to go on multiple visits to collect clues and um, to verify a hunch on, on multiple visits on from multiple reasons. So, um, I'll, I'll pause here, not talking about the film, not talking about the story, but about uh, South Park Street Cemetery. So um, from a literary and um, from a his historical and literary history of the city, chapter three, City of the Sahibs has got a subtitle, which is Cemeteries. And um, I have put the book cover on my right here. So I have, um, taken quotes from um, the cemetery section to elaborate on the importance of South Park Street Cemetery for the city itself. To feel the weight of Calcutta's European past, however, there is nothing to match Park Street Cemetery. Located at the junction of Park Street, formerly Burial Road, Round, Burial Ground Road and Rodden Street, it is the oldest cemetery in the city. The cemetery is private, but one can wander around after informing the warden. Burials no longer take place, and indeed the whole cemetery was in a dilapidated, overgrown and malarial condition until the 1970s, when some preservation work began. In the older part, the decking graves with the, their sacrophagi, towers, obelisks, urns and pagodas lure the visitor along rambling paths between the bushes like parts of London's famous Highgate. On my right bottom, there's a picture where um, you can see the detective, Feluda, along with uh, Topshe and Jotayu, um, enter through the front gate. And um, you've got the, um, well, so-called, um, you know, guard who sits there. Um, and he has got a book, book for the visitors to sign in, and then they are free to wander in. So um, these are various images from the screen. And um, in the center is one very specific with the three of them looking at the broken branch. And they would slowly discover um, the broken grave as well, the grave, um, the marble plate, which had been hammered and broke and um, opened up. So they'd slowly come to that. Uh, there's a reason behind me putting up these pictures here because there would be very many that follow. And there is a certain difference between these graves, which, uh, which are merely shown in passing as the three of them walk into the um, cemetery and a difference between the ones which are being blown into, um, in, into um, greater proportions over which uh, they stand and pour over those um, graves and uh, read those markers. And then oh, there's also 
a specific instruction coming from Feluda given over to Topshe and Jotayu that these are the specific graves you need to visit while you wait for me to come into the Park Street Cemetery. So there is a difference. So I'll uh, also put up those on the screen. These are a few um, markers that um, Topshe is asked to remember and there's a flashback sequence where um, he tries to recapitulate, he tries to remember each of these graves they have passed by. So it's not completely forgotten, but then earlier it was in passing. This time they're put up on the screen for the viewers to see because um, they're looking for a match to Godwin, the grave that has been opened. So has there been uh, another grave with the name Godwin? That's the question to which we see this flashback. Now, um, I spoke about, in just now, I spoke about specific graves which you know, kind of, um, which weren't uh, elaborated upon. They did not stand by those graves. They just, they were just walking by and um, these graves were there in the distance. But um, upon Feluda's instruction, you can see that um, there are things very specific. One on my left, the um, poet, renowned poet, Henry Louis Vivian, uh, Vivian de Rosio, who's um, they, they, uh, Topshe and Jatayu, they visit this place and then um, this one on Hindu Stuart. So um, I'll come and elaborate on these differences in a minute. But uh, this is the final word that um, Krishna Dutta writes in uh, the book. All cemeteries remind us, whoever we are, of the transitory nature of individual existence and tend to stir up strange and conflicting feelings. But these quiet old European graves in the grounds of Calcutta's churches, particularly those in Park Street Cemetery, in their small enclave, segregated from a teeming and largely indifferent city, are a unique reminder of still unresolved contradictions, not only at the tooth of um, Calcutta, but generally between East and West. So um, you can see how uh, in the literary history, a document, this book written by Krishna Datta, there has been a very specific focus on South Park Street Cemetery. So there are other burial grounds, there are other cemeteries, um, maybe equally decorated in the city, in Calcutta. But there is a specific focus, like there is in the film, which is um, kind of located, the story is located there, and uh, the location for shooting too has been South Park Street Cemetery. Uh, as far as the um, preservation, conservation is concerned, uh, Krishna Dutta remarked how um, they had largely been, um, you know, um, moss coated and all, not really preserved after um, a certain point, point of time. Um, authorities took it took upon themselves the um, onus of conserving these, preserving these monuments. From a um, I believe this is a 2006 article from Ashish Chatta. Uh, we get a detailed account of this. So in the late 1970s, there were concerted attempts by the British Association for Cemeteries in South Asia and um, APHCI, which is Association of the Preservation of Historic Cemeteries in India, to restore the cemetery. The West Bengal State Archaeology Directorate has only designated a few tombs of noted colonial personalities, for example, those of Sir William Jones and Henry de Rosio in Park Street Cemetery as protected monuments, but has kept the complex outside the purview of the powerful ancient monuments and archeological sites and remains act. The cemetery is now under the care of some gardeners and security personnel hired by the APHCI and the Christian Burial Board who protect the site from falling into ruins. So here again, you can note the bias of um, people who are noted colonial personalities, like um, Ashish Chadda points out. So there have been very specific graves, tombs, which are marked and um, which are preserved by the authorities, by the state authority for that matter, because they are important. They are important for um, uh, for, for the institution, for the state, as it is. The rest, however, are neglected. And um, 
I'll come finally to explaining this bias and how it plays out, how it is important for the South Park Street Cemetery and uh, for the text as it is. So on my left is a picture of um, this um, of, of the marble marker on the grave of Thomas Godwin, which in the film was broken and uh, the grave dug because um, people who were descendants from the Godwin family, there, were, there was actually a family tree which Feluda recreated as he was trying to understand, as he was trying to solve the mystery behind um, this particular incident. So um, people from uh, the Godwin family, descendants of the Godwin family, um, they dug up the grave to look for a relic, to look for something that's called a perigul repeater, which is actually a watch, um, something which would fetch them a huge amount of money and, in the present day. So um, this being the reason of the mystery, we now come to um, an analysis of um, what does this literary work or what does literature, visual works of art, graphic narratives um, really contribute to in this discourse of sustainability? So we spoke about heritage in uh, the beginning and I'll kind of uh, return to that very same. I um, will return to cultural memory as it is. And for this, uh, um, I'll take the assistance of um, Aleida Asman's um, essay canon and archive and I'll speak about both of these elaborate on the canon as well as the archive as um, Asman does. Through culture humans create a temporal framework that transcends the individual lifespan relating past present and future. Cultures create a contract between the living the dead and the not yet living. In recalling, iterating, reading, commenting, criticizing, discussing what was deposited in the remote or recent past, humans participate in extended horizons of meaning production. They do not have to start anew in every generation because they are standing on the shoulders of giants whose knowledge they can reuse and reinterpret. As the internet creates a framework for communication across wide distances in space, cultural memory, um, in space, cultural memory creates a framework for communication across the abyss of time. So uh, I believe this kind of condenses um, the few things we have already spoken about, how um, cultural memory is something that connects the past with the present and hopefully would do so with the future. Um, this process of meaning production uh, is, is kind of further problematized by Asman as um, this um, literary critic and theoretician does not altogether disregard, when speaking about memory, does not altogether disregard forgetting. So even before arriving at um, memory and um, different ways that memory can be plotted with the canon and the archive, Asman takes us into, uh, but, uh, it, I wouldn't call it a diversion, but takes us into forgetting. So when um, a moment earlier, when we were taking a look at different uh, screen grabs from um, the film, we noticed how there, some were important. The, um, the marker for De Rosia was important. The mark for, marker for Godwin in this particular instance was important. But again, um, some were so much in the distance, some were blurred out that we could not even read the markers. So um, is, is, is this um, something that we can categorize as forgetting? what goes into forgetting. So I'll elaborate on those as Asman goes into two different forms of forgetting, an active forgetting and a passive form of forgetting. Uh, with the active forgetting, um, Asman speaks about a deliberate destruction of, um, you know, deliberate trashing of um, things from the past. But my specific focus here is on the passive form of cultural forgetting which is related to non-intentional acts such as losing, hiding, dispersing, neglecting, abandoning, or leaving something behind. So in this particular instance of the film, 
we um, we've got um, these two branches of the Godwin family who have um, suddenly got their hands on things which were there in the family but were neglected and um, this is that very moment when they've got their hands on a letter and a diary as um, is put in the picture here the moment they get their hands uh, it is no longer passive but uh, it is turned into active but since it was passive i'll go ahead and read this in these cases the objects are not materially destroyed they fall out of the frames of attention, valuation, and use. What is lost but not materially destroyed may be discovered by accident at a later time in attics and other obscure depots or eventually be dug up again by more systematic archaeological search. And this is exactly what happens with the last bit with the more systematic archaeological search. Um, I think we should bring into mind the detective again. The detective um, who would visit um, a member of the Godwin family, a descendant of the Godwin family, and uh, would open this casket, which was with the family, but they ne never opened the no, never opened it, never checked the contents, and uh, chances upon this diary. This is uh, the diary of uh, Charlotte Godwin, and uh, Charlotte Godwin is. Um, the daughter of Thomas Godwin, whose grave was dug up. So uh, the sleuth is on the verge of um, solving the mystery, or at least um, you know, being on the right track, having finished reading this diary. Um, with forgetting, um, I, I believe when um, things are forgotten, we had an instance, we saw an instance of that in the previous slide. This time, however, they are, um, they are no longer forgotten, but by a chance discovery, this has come into the possession of whoever the people concerned are. Um, but what would they do with it? How would they value it? That's again a potential question. So as in the head of the individual, also, in the communication of society, much must be continuously forgotten to make place for new information, new challenges, and new ideas to face the present and future. Not only individual memories are irretrievably lost with the death of their owners, also a large part of material possessions and remains are lost after the death of a person when households are dissolved and personal belongings dispersed in flea markets, trashed, or recycled. So we have images where... Um, the sleuth goes into um, the Russell Exchange to inquire about what possibly could be the pericle repeater because um, antiques of this kind are put up on sale. They are um, the bid upon and um, sold to the highest bidder. That's what happens to these. Now, uh, from forgetting, I'll go on to remembering and how Asman distinguishes between what forms a canon and what forms an archive. As forgetting, remembering also has an active and a passive side. The institutions of active memory preserve the past as present, while the institutions of passive memory preserve the past as past. So for a better distinction of um, what's canon and what's archive, uh, Asman gives us an example, which is here in the second quote. She talks about a museum which um, has put up a show to attract visitors. And um, there's also in another corner of that very same museum, um, attics or um, other spaces such as the cellars where exhibits are put up too. But these exhibits, although present there, are neglected because they fail to um, attract the visitors, much like these shows do. So the former, the um, representative shows arranged by uh, the authorities concerned is categorized as a canon, and the latter, paintings and other objects in peripheral spaces is categorized as the archive. Cultural memory contains a number of cultural messages that are addressed to posterity and intended for continuous repetition and reuse. 
To this active memory belong, among other things, works of art, which are destined to be repeatedly reread, appreciated, staged, performed, and commented. This aspiration, of course, cannot be realized for all artistic artifacts. Only a small percentage acquire the status through a com complex procedure, which we call canonization. And also, in somewhat of an aside, um, Asman does go on to elaborate, does go on to bring us that parallel with canonization, with, um, with, with the very uh, procedure itself of um, um, sainthood and how uh, specific works of art are categorized as canonical literature. And uh, for an example, Asman uh, takes into consideration Harold Bloom's collection of essays on Shakespeare and Stephen Greenblatt's collection of essays on um, Shakespeare. Both of them um, talk about Shakespeare, but in different ways. So that's how um, Asman elaborates on this distinction. At the other end of the spectrum, there is a storehouse for cultural relics. These are not unmediated. They have only lost their immediate addresses. They are decontextualized and disconnected from their former frames, which had authorized them or determined their meaning. As part of the archive, they are open to new contexts and lend themselves to new interpretations. And going further on to um, elaborate on the archive, Asman um, would talk about a historical archive and a political archive. So a political archive has a specific purpose to serve, but beyond a certain time, beyond a certain government, beyond, um, uh, beyond a specific time, these political archives um, are no longer relevant. So they become redundant. And when these political archives become redundant, that is the time these are transformed into historical archives. What is stored in historical archives is materially preserved and catalogued. It becomes part of an organizational structure which allows it to be easily sourced. As part of the passive dimension of cultural memory, however, the knowledge that is stored in the archive is inert. It is stored and potentially available, but it is not interpreted. This would exceed the competence of the archivist. It is the task of others, such as the academic researcher or the artist, to examine the contents of the archive and to reclaim the information by framing it within a new context. The archive, therefore, can be described as a space that is located on the border between forgetting and remembering. Its materials are preserved in a state of latency, in a space of intermediary storage. And uh, when she, when Asman goes on to elaborate on um, these historical archives and how these are inert, because that's um, beyond the competence of the archivist, and um, we need a, an academic researcher or um, a scholar to um, give meaning to these uh, archival material. That very time, Asman also talks about how. Um, there is a certain exchange open between the archive and the canon. So things from the canon can at one point of time become redundant and can be pushed into the archive category and something from the archive can be revived and um, borrowed and rechristened as canonical a text. So in this particular instance, um, we do get to see the focus on um, Thomas Godwin on one particular grave. And um, be it the literary text or the cinematic representation, we see the certain bias about, um, uh, about graves, which um, are common knowledge to um, people who have visited South Park Street Cemetery, like the one on De Rosio or uh, the grave of Hindu Stuart. But um, we need an academic researcher. We need the detective, we need the sleuth to put things in order to, um, to solve the jigsaw puzzle of clues and thereby provide legitimacy, provide meaning to um, the Thomas Godwin grave.
And um, talking about this, I'll kind of um, move on towards my conclusion. Asman um, brings in various references. Uh, I'll take up the uh, Toni Morrison beloved reference right in the very end. But um, there is talk about archivists and librarians and uh, Asman quotes Atwood there. The archivists and librarians are the guardian angels of paper to whom we owe thanks because without them, there would be a lot less of the past than there is. And um, the 2010 production, uh, Gorostane Shabdan by Shondi Prai, this puts up on the screen and um, puts up on the map the South Park Street Cemetery and a particular part of the city. And um, it kind of connects back to the um, legacy of the British Raj and um, the um, importance of the city during the um, Raj reign for that matter. And all of this is done because of the uh, conflict between the canon and the archive that is highlighted in the due process of the investigation of the detective. Uh, the pictures put here underneath are um, is a booklet that um, the keeper of um, the cemetery hands over to Feluda, hands over to the detective and um, says this contains details about the South Park Street Cemetery. And um, a booklet that talks about the history, that talks about the legacy, that talks about the heritage of this particular cemetery is something um, that we can go online and read up. Or for that matter, I believe, um, as I come to my final word, I believe um, as scholars, as um, um, academicians, we can also take a look at the Calcutta Heritage Walks and many such other walks that have been now organized in the city, which take us on this walking tour of South Park Street Cemetery, yes, but also to other burial grounds. So South Park Street Cemetery has kind of been in the canon, it has been canonized. But the uh, other burial grounds, that too would find legitimacy in these heritage walks, I believe. So that's another aspect of it coming into the sustainability idea. So I'll conclude with this. Um, this is where um, Asman talks about the purpose of um, works of literature, of uh, graphic narratives, of um, visual medium, and how they contribute to the whole discourse of sustainability. While historians have to adjust their research and questions to the extension and range of the archives, literary writers may take the liberty to fill in the gaps. And um, goes on with the final word, imaginary literary supplement to historical memory is not a filling of the gap, but a marking of it. So um, the last bit, the imaginary literary supplement uh, is a comment made vis-a-vis Toni Morrison's beloved. And um, I think it also works for Shondi Pry's presentation of Gorostane Shabdan and specifically of South Park Street Cemetery here. So it is, um, it's a marker. We're not necessarily saying it's a supplement for a historical archive. But again, um, a visit to the past, a continuity, that's what cultural memory is there for. And cultural memory is um, the integral element here for um, the discourse on cultural sustainability. So um, with that, I um, will end my presentation. Okay, thank you, Namrata, for that perceptive presentation. We now move on. Uh, our next speaker is our uh, student from the PG final year batch, uh, Shudipta Dotto. His paper is entitled Identity, Displacement and Migration, the Trope of Journey from Mantos Toba Tek Singh to Amitav Ghosh's Gun Island. Now over to Shudipta. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I hope I am visible uh, and audible as yes, well. Yes, you are. Am I? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, both. So firstly, 
my sincere thanks to my professors without whom i wouldn't have been able to turn up here to present a paper in front of you so all credits goes to them now uh good evening to all for those who are present in the audience many of you may wonder um, when you hear the title of my paper how this topic goes with the broader theme for today that is sustaining the historical past for an answer what i can speak what i can say is i have taken two texts by two different authors belonging from two different spatio temporal schemes but what happens in between the text uh, is equally important uh then what is happening in the text both the text the entire journey from point a that is the subcontinent partition to point b from point a that is partition to point b and point b is our own generation our own time that is amitabh ghosh bringing out in gun island this entire journey from point a to point b has been recorded here this journey is obviously metaphorical and i would try to look at what was it that made the fear of displacement that was there in toba texing that fades away when we reach gun island when we reach amitabh ghosh so i have some rough notes here and i will be referring to them from time to time as i have very little confidence on my memory so uh, let us begin with manto the person manto the writer manto who works in the bombay film industry who was once a part uh, of the progressive writers association and who observed very closely all those turmoils are uh, just happening before 1947 and also after it. and he very importantly with equal attention watched the anti climax partition many of the patriots during that time were fighting uh, hands in hands uh, irrespective of their religions or their ethnicity and many of them was kind of singing to themselves ami onno kothao jabo na ami ei deshetei thakbo but they had to leave they had to leave for an alien land that they have never visited before a uh, manto to being somewhat insecure of his religious identity and the heated environment that was there full of hatred and religious and harmony he moved to lahore pakistan and there in lahore his life and his career both faced a constant decline and the consideration of manto's personal life is very important because whatever he was writing he was writing it with a journalistic precision he never used an euphemistic term to describe rapes or prostitution or bloodshed or violence as you see in 10 rupees or thanda gosh or uh, a room with a bright light anything so this kind of man we should not forget and the fact that is uh, manto himself was displaced much unwillingly and he went through some serious identity crisis his heart was hanging just in the middle of lahore and bombay he belonged to both the cities and at the same time he belonged to nowhere now the character toba takes thing he is also already at a loss of identity as you know his original name bishan singh 
had been replaced by the name of the village that he belonged to. When Bishan Singh collapses, both his personal as well as his community and identity go for a toss. He is not a lunatic. Bishan Singh or Tobatek Singh, I think, is not a lunatic. Rather, he is a victim of lunacy. Whose lunacy? Of the governments, of those people in power who are dividing the land, who are dividing the nation. Khalid Hassan very rightly said that India was free, Pakistan was free uh, from the very moment of his birth. But in both states, man's enslavement continued. This seems to me to be an echo of what Manto said in his letter to Uncle Sam, that uh, when he compared the independence of the Pakistani people with that of the birds whose wings have been cleaved. Here, oh, one thing I would like to point to. Bishan Singh is never displaced, literally. He was always in an asylum, or at least for the past few years, for a, at least for, a, for the last decade before partition, and asylum, you know, is no living thing that can move by itself. Partition was the name of the madness. It was the madness which displaced people who was not even sane enough to move by their own. Though how ironic it is that the asylum sin mess were at least sane, uh, more sane than those people in power, as I have earlier said. And I don't really think that the sense of Indianness was one and the same before and after the 1947 partition. You know, there is a very common term in cricket, no man's land. Yes, we have crossed this term many times when we have studied Mancho, we have studied Tobatik Singh. As Devendra Isar points out, many of Manto's characters, and obviously Tobatik Singh is probably the best example of it, often find themselves in liminal spaces. Here, Tobatik Singh is like a cricket ball. High up in the air, two fielders are rushing towards each other. They're trying to catch the ball. And the ball doesn't know where it will end up finally. And these fielders are India and Pakistan. Tobatek Singh lands in the middle. He belongs to none. A man finally rests on his back after what, maybe 15 years? But now maybe he do not have, he does not have any uh, national identity, so to say, but he is no more a ball. He is no more that rope in the game of tug of war, feeling that tension. But he now deserves, he, he now gets the much deserved rest that as a human being, he always longed for. Now from the allusions to sports, uh, let us move to some basic science. I have always thought of Newton uh, to be more a philosopher than a scientist. And I will take him up. Uh, in the first law of motion by Newton, what he says is that an object at rest will stay at rest if no external force is applied. And I think that is what? The principle of inertia, right? Uh, people were at rest before 1947. And the external force in the form of partition, in the form of political power, it forced them to a cross-border migration. And especially we, the people uh, residing in both the sides of Bengal, Epar Bangla, Opar Bangla, we witnessed this influx heavily, in heavy numbers, from the riots in 1946 
to at least the early 1970s in between the bhashandolan and 1966 riot 1970 bola cyclone and 1971 when bangladesh is getting its independence now as i have said east pakistan becomes bangladesh on 16th of december 1971 as we all know just about a year ago in november november 10 11 12 13 uh, 1970 the cyclone bhola hits bangladesh oh sorry not bangladesh but obviously east pakistan i think this cyclone damaging lives of millions of people was actually a mirror mirror to what it reflected the political turmoil that was going on in the land during that time in ghana island where um, the character of nilima elaborates on her visit to the shrine of bonduki sadagar uh, and she refers to um, the cyclone and to the raimangol river and yes raimangol rivers is also a no man's land or a no man's water body whatever uh, as the border is blurred there uh, and there nirima also talk about human migrations later we come to know that even the narrator deems grandparents also migrated from bangladesh to india during all this turmoil in fact if you look closer we'll find that the major characters most of the major characters i would say are uh, from ghana island they do not stand still they always move beat our narrator beat pia or maybe sinta tipu lofi everyone they move and i think their needs their personal needs make them move our narrator din is settled in brooklyn he was an antique book dealer now here comes again the motif of sustaining the historical past our narrator belong to that industry so um, he was settled in brooklyn but he moves to kolkata his native land pia was brought up in america and she moved to india sundarbans odisha where she did her research and she concentrated on the migration again on the migration of the gangetic dolphins je gulo ke amra ekhon shushuk bolli hoy shei gulo ke but yes uh, i am now concentrating on the character of rofi rofi wanted to migrate right and not only rofi there were many like him belonging to that age group belonging to that class so why and how they migrate it is elaborately explained in the novel by chip so now here we come to newton's second law second law of motion and that states that the rate of change of momentum of a body over time is directly proportional to the force applied and occurs in the same direction as the applied force so what is this applied force uh which causes this positive uh change in momentum the answer is given by tip it is internet high speed internet 3g 4g and maybe 5g some years later high speed internet and maybe some smartphones as well when bhola hit the sundarbans you know i think there were not enough uh, precautions taken by the civilians or the government a few radio announcements or uh, some newspaper report and that's it but now you see you have literally been able to track the amphan or the yas in your smartphones sitting in our rooms we have internet connection 
we had websites we saw that and we got to know everything each and everything about those cyclones that one must know in the time of manto or even in the 70s there were only a few uh, privileged households i would say who had telephones but now who does not have one cell phone or at least a smartphone uh, where internet is accessible yeah we the generation z we are more interested in we we prefer texting over calling we use social media we can share photos and videos and 3d photos maybe 360 degree photos and what not uh, let's put it in an umbrella term we share information with each other right we share information but again there's a twist we do not only share information we share our dreams yes not only information but dreams as well suppose a friend a facebook friend of rofi mm, uploads a picture in facebook where he is seen roaming the paris streets or mm, having a beautiful uh, travel by a gondola in venice and rofi watches that rofi starts dreaming the dream will travel by the internet and will reach rofi and will trigger him there's a point now people can be forced by circumstances to migrate as the likes of manto or dean's grandparents and fear and panic can also cause migration in in obviously great numbers in fact people can also migrate for their dreams for a better uh, for a better living for a better lifestyle again we are not birds or dolphins or whales or sharks who migrate at some particular months or particular time period of the year their pattern of migration is apprehensible by what we call kairos which in greek means season or weather but human migration is understandable is comprehensible by the study of chronos it is a continuous process chronological process where one migrant can draw 10 more and those 10 can attract maybe 100 it goes on it grows in a gp rate so but when we want to minutely analyze migration we must take help uh, from the geologist the geographers or the sociologists so i have done uh, first up we have ernst george ravenstein a german man geographer who was probably the first ever to theorize laws of migration in as early as 1885 he was studying inter county migration in britain after industrial revolution in uh, 19th century england in 19th century britain mm. but surprisingly his theory or maybe some points at least from his theory i find very relevant here one he says uh, there is an inverse relation between distance and volume of migration uh, that is most of the migrants prefer to move to only a shorter distance okay but ravenstein also states that when migrants go for a long distance it is their preference to the large centers of commerce or of industries we see in the novel gun island there are women who emigrates from the isla struck sundarbon to the center the city kolkata 
and they succumb to prostitution. They know that they they have to do something for their for 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 But what is participation in Rome? They want to uh, cross boundary. They want to the European gateways. They attracted to these Arabs and Belgians, but they know that even the smartest developed city of Asia or of Africa cannot offer a greater dream or a better opportunity um, than those big cities or any big city of Europe, for that matter. Uh, this is to the industry areas. And this holds true for the people. Shudipto, you are not audible. Mm -hmm. Your uh, well, internet the, connection uh, is not very stable. We can't the, hear the, you. We can't tell you. It's getting broken. Comes if a stop with so the we can't on you. mobility. That the number from an audience professional. Shudipto, can you hear us? Is present at the destination. I don't think he this can hear us. I was talking so. about. Shudipto, we can't hear That's you. London or Paris or where? We can can't hear that you. A chat we can't hear Opportunities, varied opportunities that are Delhi or Kolkata or any Cape <coughs> Town for that matter. Shudipto, Shudipto, there is an issue with your network. So there is an issue with the network. We cannot hear you properly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, yes, Hello, there is an issue with I your think, network. I think, mm -hmm. I think it would be better if you turn off your video and if you just keep your voice since you are not having a presentation. Yes. So uh, that would that would stabilize the network. Oh, I okay, think. Okay. Yeah, possibly. Uh, now. Am I audible now? No, 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 you are not. No, no. Shudipto, still uh, broken. Switch off your camera. Switch off your, switch off your camera, Shudipto. Camera. I don't think he can hear us also. Hmm. Let us write. Please call. Please call him. I, I think I think he has left. I think he has left the studio. So let us wait for a few minutes. Uh, yeah, Shudipto has yeah, joined again. Am I not? Hello. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's much, not, much better, Shudipto. Mm. You, you better keep it like mm -hmm. that. Okay, I yes. just switch the network connections. Okay, so I'm uh, Janine. I'm Koto. Be a matter of Uh, I was talking about. So you continue from here. Only. Okay, ma'am. Yes, yes, uh, we heard that. Okay, so now I come to AC Stoffer who in 1940 theorizes on mobility, he suggests that the number of migrants from an origin to a destination is directly proportional to the number of opportunities present at the destination. Just what I have said earlier, that London, a Venice, or a Paris can offer you various opportunities that a Cape Town or a Delhi cannot. Again, it is their existing world knowledge. In 1966, Everett Lee, another famous geographer, notes a very obvious thing. For every major migration or a major migration stream, a counter stream develops. Now you see, during this pandemic, many of the IT professionals are looking up to metros like Bangalore or Mumbai, maybe there are working
from home for the time being but sooner or later they are going to move to those cities to sustain their jobs there now we have parallelly been migrant workers who were living on those cities for years and when the lockdowns are announced they are hurrying back to their home and this is called reverse migration why they are rushing towards their home it is a question of identity you see dinonath becomes din piali becomes pia or tutul becomes tipu and you know the west has the power to rename anyone or anything from the orient right reverse migration of din or pia helps invigorating their old official names which were distorted when they were replaced i don't hear any sound now i think i've lost connection can anybody hear me i can hear you yes yes we can hear you shipradi yeah kintu kichu ami kichu shunte pachhi can you hear me no no i think shudipto has stopped talking yeah shudipto finish off your time is also up please round off it should be to there i mean there is a very serious mm, uh, network connectivity issue, issue, issue i guess mm. hello 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 i will just round up in, i will just round up in yes, one minute yes yes please round yes. off yeah 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 okay ah uh, finally one thing we should not forget when dean or pia they migrate they do it legally with all these pass- passports and visas but when tipu or oh, does that he does it illegally and sadly this is more important in the history in making that we are discussing here and in an interview with j r ramakrishnan amitav ghosh himself talk about that episode where dean encounters tipu for the first time and dean do an ancient book dealer a famous one he looks that he is jealous of tipu that he can move anywhere and everywhere without any legal document so to round off i would like to say that a uh, migration can also be a question of survival or for a better li- livelihood and that is the biggest point of difference between mantos time and ghoshes the people during mantos time feared to move from where they belong to all the time and now we the generation z do not fear moving it is the world of traveling it is the very difference between toba texing and tipu and this movement of history is what i have tried to capture here so i round off thank you okay thank you shudipto we now pass on to two other speakers who are also our students from uh, first year ma and uh, second they are in the second semester they are shonindu dam and kashir ali their presentation is entitled reinvigorating socio cultural history through textual and visual narratives a critical study of anandu mot and didilis artugrul you have 20 minutes for presentation thank you ma'am i'll start sharing my screen please let me know start. yes yes Have you shared your screen? We don't see anything. Yes, ma'am. Can you? Yes, it's okay. Yes, yes, it's okay now. Yes. Yes. 
uh, just let me do it again. Let's... Yeah, there are too many windows which are. Just give me one minute, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can you see now? Uh, there are too many no, windows. Still... No, still. Yes, see so anything. you have to close yeah. some of them. It's 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 okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, kasi, kasi. okay you, you, you just put it right there. Hmm. I will I will guide you right there. Yes. Okay. Am I visible? Yes. Mm. I'm also present. It's yes, coming it's okay. slowly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So, yes, okay. I'll start. Thank you very much, Sneha ma'am, for giving us the introduction. And a very good evening to all our respected teachers, other speakers who spoke so fluently and gave their rich perspectives. All my seniors, my beloved classmates and juniors, and to all the audience who are and will be watching this. We'd also like to thank CC ma'am from the core of our hearts for bestowing us with this opportunity of presenting at CSDCM. Also, I would thank all my professors who guide and teach us how and where to look. Now, the theme of this webinar is sustaining the historical past. But what kind of history and what kind of past are we talking about here? Our history is a history of war, a history of massacre. We remember, even memorize, that who won which war, who conquered more land. But history is much more than that. History is also how people live, how they breathe, how, how they celebrate their victory, how they celebrate their defeat. Thus, our paper is about the sociocultural history, not the political one. Now, you guys have read about decolonizing the mind, the theory of Ngugi a thousand times. And I'm not going to bore you guys with that same thing again. So let me give you guys a fresh perspective. So in the movie Arrival, there's a dialogue that language is the first weapon drawn in a conflict. Now, the Britishers were the last dominant colonizers of this world. And to have the cultural upper hand, they deliberately belittled the history, the culture, the philosophy of their colonies. They consciously subjugated the people to psychologically cripple them. Even Macaulay said that the entire knowledge of the Orient can be fitted in a single shelf of a good European library, which is a very racist and derogatory comment. But artists, writers, painters, creators, revolutionaries in every part of the world and in every age through their work, through their voice, have tried to reinvigorate their own past, their own history, and show the contemporary people, people bring to them that they too have a glorious history, they too have a glorious past, and thus a glorious existence, and they do not need to feel inferior to anyone. My friend Shonendu and I, we will try to explore that in two major regions of the world. One is South Asian region and the other is Middle Eastern region. My friend Shonendu will explore the former through the textual narrative Anandamot by Bhogmin Chandra Chattopadhyay and I will explore the latter through the TV series Dirilis Arthurul. Over to you Shonendu. Uh, thank you very much Kasir. Uh, good evening everyone. So uh, taking the cue from Kasir, I would like to continue. Uh, but before that, uh, due to some internet problem, I think uh, I am going to uh, shut my video off so that you can uh, hear my voice more properly. Yeah. Uh, 
so the 19th century discourse on hinduism is often regarded as neo hinduism or hindu revivalism but now i am going to point out how anandam mot written by bunkim chandra chatterjee was not only a revival of the glorious hindu past but also a reinvention or a reconstruction of the past in order to reinvigorate the national hindu identity thereby not only sustaining the glorious past it is important that so they are uh, thereby not only sustaining the glorious hindu past but also contemporizing it according to the need of the time so here lies two questions what were the needs of the time and number two how did bumkim contemporize the usable past at first i will discuss what were the needs of the time uh, next slide please at first we are going to point out what was the colonial narrative regarding bengali men narrative in the context of their prolonged subjugation first by mughals and then by britishers in order to create a psychological domination what the colon what the colonial rulers did is they represented or rather should i take the liberty to say misrepresented hindu culture in order to create a false narrative james mill wrote three volumes of history the history of british in india without ever even visiting india at all i mean what can be more ironic than this it's like doing a phd on raskin bond without ever reading a single book written by him so this colonial rulers like james mill or thomas macaulay marked bengali hindus as uncivilized effeminate barbaric helpless timid and accustomed to couch under oppression next slide this now bomkim created a counter narrative okay so bomkim explained that causes of hindu subjugation has nothing at all has nothing at all to do with their physical martial or material prowess rather it is embedded in their cultural understanding of power cultural understanding of power by that what, what do i mean of course there are certain cultures and civilizations who focus on external materialistic conquests but our south asian culture especially the culture of indian subcontinent focuses on internal spiritual quest so it's not about external but internal it's not about materialistic but spiritual and it's more of a quest than that of a conquest bomkim also identifies westernization and implementation of english education in india as a cause of uh, bengali emasculation because colonial men uh, because uh, co because colonial men after going through those false narratives started to think themselves as inferior to their colonial masters so at this juncture uh, we can understand what were the needs of the time it was mainly to counter the colonial narrative or the colonial discourse propagated by the by, uh, by the then colonial masters next slide please so now the question comes what did bomkim do and how did he do well bomkim quote and unquote right back Bunkim writes Anandamot where he abrogates and appropriates the colonial historiography. Anandamot skillfully appropriates the potential of invented traditions and imagined community. We should not forget that his aim was not to establish the universal truth. It's very very important. We must not forget his aim was not to establish the universal truth but to create a particular history of the land. by dint of his imaginary artistic imagination and in order to do so he employed three major tools as you can see on your screens number 1 ascetic martiality number 2 myth of the nation as mother and number 3 a new form of devotionalism 
So by implementing these three tools, Bomkin contemporizes the past according to his need. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now comes what is aesthetic martiality at all? It's quite simple. It is embedded in the term itself. It's a combination of asceticism and martial prowess. During that time, there were two. During that time means during uh, Bonkim's time. During Bonkim's time, there were two popular notions of manhood. One was Brahmanical manhood, signifying asceticism, and another one was Kshatriya manhood, signifying martial prowess. So Bonkim did something very interesting. That Bonkim merges two contradictory figures from colonial narrative itself. Because in colonial narratives, we can find, as you can follow in uh, 2.a, the popular wandering arm seeking ascetic described in colonial narratives as idlers or frauds. And number two, the revenue collecting warrior ascetics portrayed as bandits, murderers, and villains. Bonkin categorically, uh, categorically merges these two figures which we can find in colonial narrative as well by doing this. Uh, okay. So, Bumkim, uh, although there is no doubt that Bumkim promotes masculine valor, there should not be any doubt. But at the same time, he balances it with the values of justice, compassion and forgiveness. So, asceticism plus martiality comes ascetic martiality. Next slide, please. Now comes myth of the nation as mother. British scholars classified the history of India into three categories. Uh, I'm again pointing it out that this historiography were mostly done, not mostly, like uh, almost 99% were done by the Britishers themselves. So the British scholars classified the history of India into three categories. One, the glorious classical age before the Islamic invasion. Number two, the dark medieval age during the Islamic rule. And number three, progress oriented modern age after arrival of the Britishers. Now, Boom Kim very cleverly used this understanding of history in order to create a national myth by using some iconographic representations. What were they? As you can find uh, in number uh, point number three, in part one, chapter 11, Le uh, rebel leader Satyananda guides newly initiated Mahendra through three iconographic images of the mother as nation. And, this and, three, and these three successive images were of Jagodhatri, Kali, and Durga. Jagodhatri was the nurturer of the world, mother as she was before the Islamic rule. Kali was famine, hum humiliation, and wind stricken mother as she is during the Islamic rule. And Durga is a warrior goddess as the mo as mother as she will be after the Islamic rule. Now we can find out that after Jagodhati, when Durga emerges as the mother of nation, he is not only the nurturer of the world, like the simple caregiver, rather, she is uh, rather she is a warrior as well. Another interesting thing is, uh, rather which is most important, like all these divine figures have been given a new origin. All these divine figures have been given a new origin by Bumkim because it has nothing to do with their Puranic origin stories or their Puranic identities. Next slide please. So all of these things create a new form of devotion which comes handy as a political register during that time. So in Ananda Mot, we can find two different or two separate traditions of devotionalism that is Shakta tradition directed towards the figure of a bloodthirsty Kali and Vaishnava tradition directed towards the figure of Lord Krishna. But again we need to remember that this Lord Krishna was not the erotic lover. Rather, he was the warrior and slayer of demons. By superimposing this, re, uh, by superimposing this matri bhakti, which is kind of a devotional sacrifice on a reinvented Krishna bhakti, which stands for valor, 
it altogether creates a new form of political register but it is carved in the form of dedication or devotion towards cultic tradition there is another break from traditional traditional bhakti convention that is in our culture we of, uh, we know that when we talk of ascetics or sanyasis or monks we think them as passive characters they don't do much action they sit on a particular place and they simply meditate they don't take participate in active action but in uh, ananda mot we can find the ascetics uh, ascetics are taking part in active action and what was the action to make the country independent so again there is a change these ascetics have uh, the relationship between these ascetics or the deity and the devotee has transformed from bhakti yoga to karma yoga or action that is direct participation thereby the, the uh, thereby the divine activism or the uh, is there any problem with the sharing yes we can't see it anymore okay kashi please uh, reshare it yes kashi please reshare it and then i am going to continue okay i think kashi is not connected Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I think I should continue. Okay, you continue okay. with the paper. You can continue yeah. scrolling though. Hmm. Okay. okay, okay, okay. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, as I have said that, uh, so this divine activity, so this divine form of activity, activism, so the divine intervention, we cannot find divine intervention any more in Ananda Mat because. as we can find that it is the santans who have taken the pledge to make the country independent it is not makali or madurga who will come from heaven and they they are going to participate in those acts so again the relationship between the deity and the devotee has been changed according to the need of the time ah uh, yeah so yes uh, this is the slide yes bonkim uh, now i am going to talk talk now i am going to talk about bonkim's achievement in ananda mot uh yeah Hello? so bomkim uh, ma'am your Hello? audio is hamala just no shanindu please continue yeah so bomkim uh, so what are the achievements of bomkim in anand mot first of all bomkim skillfully combines history with his own artistic imagination in order to create a sense of nationalism in a colonized nation secondly so bomkim was consolidating anti british sentiments he did not make it explicit chandrabadi bomkim please read the sarius chandrabadi oh god chandrabadi please read the sarius chandrabadi please mute yourself chandrabadi please mute yourself Can you hear us? French. Oh, Chandra Badi, Chandra Badi, please mute yourself. Ah, yes. We can hear your phone. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, now cast it. Sorry, Swan and to continue. Yes. Yeah. So as I was saying, the first thing we, uh, the first achievement of Gongkim, we can say that Gongkim skillfully combines history. with his own artistic imagination in order to create a sense of nationalism in a colonized nation secondly though bumkim was consolidating anti british sentiments he did not ever make it explicit bumkim through his reinvented socio cultural past could camouflage the whole patriotic sentiment thus british officials failed literally failed to understand whether anandamot is a political novel or a pre or a reinvigoration of the socio cultural past now i would like to uh, uh, conclude my presentation uh, next slide please that though there are certain achievements of anandamot and we all consider it to be the uh, first historical novel of uh, historical novel of india 
But again, there are some controversies around Bomkim and Anandamon. The first is definitely uh, Bomkim believes that British rule was still beneficial for the Indians as a pathway towards intellectual development and knowledge of natural sciences. And the second, war against Muslims would recreate a pattern of masculinity, heroism, and Hindu idealism that would enhance future nationhood. So, the commonest allegations against Bumkim after 140 years are firstly, was Bumkim a Hindu extremist? Was Bumkim an anti Muslim? Was Bumkim a British apologist? And most interestingly, was Bumkim the predecessor of Sangh Parivar's Hindutva ideology? Now, for the time constraint, definitely I, I cannot delve deep into all these controversies, but through my presentation, I would like all of you to think about it and uh, to uh, start your own research. So that much from my side. Kasira, over to you. OK. As my friend Shonendu very richly explored the South Asian region to Anandamot, I will try to uh, explore the Middle Eastern region to Dirilis Arthurul. Now, before that, let us see the pretext of Arthurul, in what time and in what context it came. So, in contemporary popular culture, there is hardly there is hardly any Muslim representation. Uh, there is hardly any film or work based on the lives of Muslims. Muslims play very minor characters, and when they play the protagonist, they are the bad guys or the terrorist or just a brainwashed suicide bomber. Or in the Bollywood movies, they are just the mafias who runs the Mumbai underworld. So Muslims all around the world do not relate and find themselves in this culture. They suffer an identity crisis. They ask themselves, do they even do they even belong here? This exactly sets the pretext of the Turkish television series Deliris Arthurul, or translated as Resurrection Arthurul. Now, Dirilis Arthurul is set in 13th century Middle East and it is centered around the life of Arthurul or later known as Arthurul Ghazi, a historical legend of Turkey. Arthurul is a character to whom people can look up to. He is a fearless warrior, but he is also chivalrous. He is someone who won't flinch to stand up to fight for his rights or, or his nation's rights, but when it comes to peace, he is the first one to offer his friendship. He is someone who respects the elders and customs of ancient times and loves the young ones also. He dreams for a better future for his people and strives to get that, strives to reach there. Arthurul, the historical Arthurul, was the father of Osman I, the first Sultan of the Great Ottoman Empire. Besides Arthurul, the show also offers a variety of characters with whom Muslims can connect. They can find their solace, their satiety in the stories of the show. They can relate their insecurities, their ideologies, and uh, and their customs with them. Uh, so uh, the show offers Muslims around the world a culture to belong, something they can relate to, something they can feel their own. Now the first episode of the show was aired on 11 December 2014. And since then, it had five seasons and 150 episodes. And it is a rage in Turkey, where the Muslim population is 99.6%. In 2020 Ramadan, the show was dubbed in Urdu and was aired in Pakistan's official government channel, PTV. And the first episode has 5.5 million views. So you guys all can get an idea how popular this show is. Now. The show is not only popular, but also digs quite deep and presents us with the vibrant culture of the then 13th century Ottomans. For the show, 16,000 square meters of area was used with a dedicated zoo and a village was made up for shooting and also a part of the castle with its own dungeon, with its own rooms and all. <coughs> The series glimpses in, in the tribal culture and its uh, multifaceted modes of war, peace, 
happiness and even sorrow. Uh, we can see the tribal, if we see the show, we can see the tribal cuisines, their eating habits. Uh, we see that uh, with every in every feast, the every people bring their own spoon, which is very typical of that time. We see their dressing style. Now, for this show, 8,000 costumes were made from scratch. And every woman, especially the elites, and every male have their own headgear. The women have their own dressing style, have their own fashion, and the men have their own Kai hat. Kai hat is, uh, Kai is their tribe name, so it is known as Kai hat. So the moods of celebration and mourning, the moods of how they celebrate their victory and their defeat, they all have been typically depicted in their peculiar ways in their show. But for me, what stands out, what goes beyond this culture is that their philosophy. Now the picture I have used in my uh, presentation, it is the picture of the actor who played Ibn Arabi. Now Ibn Arabi is a historical figure. He is from Andalusia, the modern day Spain. Ibn Arabi becomes the spiritual leader of Arthur, a spiritual uh, guide of Arthur. And he guides Arthur whenever he is in distress. Ibn Arabi shares his wisdom and quotes from Quran and Hadith, which are the two major books of Islam. And whenever Dirilis is in distress or whenever Dirilis needs guidance, he seeks the advice of Ibn Arabi. And when Dirilis fails, when Dirilis is sad, uh, Ibn Arabi says not to lose faith and have trust in the Almighty and go for, keep striving for his dream, keep striving for his dream, for a, a dream, for a better future of, for his people. Now, this only a representation of the Sufism, of the effects of Sufism that, uh, that was evident in 13th century culture, not only on Muslims, but also on non-Muslims. Now, the show is so popular that uh, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan urged his youth of his country to watch this show, show rather than watching the Western culture and learn some Islamic values and customs from, from it. Even the uh, president of Venezuela tweeted about this wearing a typical Kai hat. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he himself visited the shooting site several times with his family. Uh, it is hugely popular in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Azerbaijan, Zord Jordan, which is uh, quite predictable because these, uh, apart from India, and, uh, India, most of the countries are Muslim dominated countries, but it goes beyond it and it is popular in 136 countries all, of, all around the world, according to the producers. Now, what interested me most is the representation of women in their society. Now, contrary to popular beliefs, where Muslim women's, women are believed to be oppressed, they are always behind the parda, they don't have their say, they don't, uh, the Muslim society doesn't value them. But in the show, we see the speakers, uh, the uh, women characters, not only play interesting and important part in the show, but also in their society. They are wise counselors, and most of their predictions come true in the show, which the males of the society avoided. And trade was the main source of economy back then. And the whole thing of trade was, uh, uh, was given to the woman, was trusted to the woman. And they are even occasional warriors. As you can see the picture in the picture I've used uh, in my presentation. They fight for themselves, they fight for their, uh, when needed, they fight for their house, they fight for their people, they fight for their nation. But also, so we see a strong rep representation of women, but this also gave rise to some controversy. Controversy. So, although it is far from the explicit nudity of uh, Western media or in any international media, the show still shows a woman for, uh, in some scenes without their headscarf and a little bit of free mixing is also there when the actor and the actresses uh, meet in private, uh, which, is, uh, a, a, which, which is a little deviation from the strict Islamic law known as Sharia. So the scholars from uh, Muslim world have criticized it. Even 
Egypt in Egypt a fatwa was published against it uh, it is banned in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and uh, Zakir Naik a famous Muslim scholar he said that although it is better to watch this show than watching the Hollywood movies as it is it shows the explicit nudity but it is still non not advisable because it is still not 100% halal now religion the reason the show become so popular uh, is religion religion owes a big part in the cause in the result of the popularity now in then ottoman society islam was the uh, dominant and probably only religion and it is the base of all their superstructures from the uh, from their religion islam they superstructured their values their customs their uh, ways of punishing their ways of trading their ways of laws they celebrated and defeated uh, uh, according to islam which instantly connected the muslims around the world and invoked a religious sentiment now they also use words like alhamdulillah inshallah and they offers namaz uh, regularly so uh, it has invoked a religious sentiment and all over the, the muslims from all over the world connected with that show easily arthurul was a small tribe prince and from there he brought all the middle east together and bound them with under one custom under one value system he actually put the seeds of the great ottoman empire he fought against the mighty mongols and the crusaders and solidified their identity and existence as a nation as a empire now the saudi government has criticized turkish president erdogan of playing his propaganda under this mask of the show of reinstating the turkish dominance over other middle eastern countries and in the present israel palestine conflict even erdogan gave a statement that official press statement that the un will have to play for every life lost and they, if they do not do so we will form our own league this certainly gives some air to the allegation made against erdogan but propaganda or not no one can deny the effects of the show this show gave muslims not only in turkey but all over the world something to look forward to something to hope to hope for a better future it is more so relevant in present day where muslims are oppressed all over the world be it uh, rohingyas in myanmar or uighurs in uh, china or in sri lanka or in france when uh, muslims get fined for not uh, for openly practicing their faith this shows this show uh, diliris arturul revisited the glorious past of the ottomans one of the greatest empire of the world and not only sustained the socio cultural history but reinvigorated and reincarnated the soul of history in the bodies of the contemporary youth and society and they are swept off uh, swept off their feet with a nostalgia and a fascination for their past as burak ozetin a uh, professor of istanbul university he said that they are in a way rewriting the ottoman history for the current turkish people motivated with which is known as neo ottoman cool or neo ottoman nationalism they dream for a better future a future out of their present misery out of their present horror which they can live and where they can live and practice their faith keeping their head side because the public received the show, uh, show so well the producers are already in the second season of its sequel named as kurulus osman or the uh, uh, establishment osman which is based on osman 1 the first sultan and also the son of uh, arturul gazi and the first uh, sultan of ottoman empire so that's it from my side I'll invite my friend Shonendu once again to sum up our efforts with a few words. Up to you, Shonendu. Thank you, Kasir. Uh, so, as you could see, Kasir and I have taken two different modes of narratives. One is textual, and another is visual. But we can find both the narratives recreate the past in order to contemporize it, uh, contemporize it as well as juxtapose it 
uh, in the juxtapose the past within the present. Although we presented two completely different regions, cultures, and religions, we can find that how the national past of a can, uh, how the national past of a country can be used as a major tool to create a myth, a uh, uh, myth of of the nation, uh, the myth of the nation and nationhood in order to inspire the contemporary people, be it 19th century Hindus or 21st century Muslims. So finally, I would like to conclude remembering Napoleon, as you can uh, see on the slide, that what is history if not a fable agreed upon? So we would like to end our presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and time. Thank you, Shornendu and Kasir. I think now uh, we will have the question answer session. Uh, the first questions are for uh, Dr. Oniban Shorkar. Uh, the questions that we have received uh, via WhatsApp. One says that I hope uh, Dr. Shorkar is with us. Uh, can we have Dr. Shorkar with us? Yeah. Can you hear? Uh, me? The first, yes. Yes, I'll read that out. Uh, the first question is by Shilajit Bisha. She's a former student of our department, and uh, he's now an independent researcher. This is a question. Can you read it on the screen? Yes, or should I, I read it out for you? I can oh, read it. Is thanatourism a more concise concept than dark tourism since it guides us towards the more specific idea of death? What could be the general dissimilarities between dark tourism and thanatourism? Thank you, Shilajit, for uh, such a uh, nice question. It is a very uh, interrogating question, I think. Actually, uh, Thana tourism and dark tourism is not the same, but under Thana tourism, dark tourism, uh, they are not so much similar. What is the dissimilarity is that when we talk about Thena tourism, we are uh, specifically uh, talking tourism from death perspective. But when we are talking about uh, dark tourism, we are we are not mentioning only death. It is uh, death is a part of it, but uh, memorials or some wars, some genocides, uh, some uh, symbolic events are also taken part uh, in dark tourism. Uh, but in Thena tourism, we are specifically uh, uh, focusing towards death. So uh, basically, we may say that uh, Thena tourism is much more specific towards death, but dark tourism is uh, not so much specific about death, but it comprises a part which is death. OK. okay. So Any more can we move on to the next to question? Yeah. Yeah, the next question is by our student semester two, Kumardeep Sharkar. Uh, he's saying that do the visitors who visit the temples or any historically significant places actually value it from the perspective of sustaining the historical past, or they just visit it only to relish the outside ambience or atmosphere of that place? What I mean is, I suppose the temple of Konara that most of the visitors may not know its historical value. So how far is this sustainability practiced here? How many people actually grow, go through the study of the place uh, he or she visits uh, before visiting that place? This is his question. Thank you, Kumar. Actually, uh, if, you are, if you are thinking about tourism from fun concept, uh, that is a different thing altogether. When you are thinking about, say, you have given an example uh, of Konarak. So if you don't understand the history behind building the Konarak, uh, why that Konarak was built, what is the Hindu deity which is being worshipped there, uh, what is the historical relevance of Konarak temple. So you, if you don't understand this, if you visit there, you will not be able to uh, reflect uh, the visit. So therefore, before going to any place, I think we should study the history, the culture of that place so that we can actually be respectful towards those sites which we are visiting. So here co comes the concept of ethical and unethical tourism. So I think we are educated enough that before we go 
to different places we should try to understand the history and the culture of those places which is very uh, easily uh, gettable through the uh, wikipedia or any other social media sites nowadays so i think uh, to make it much more ethical we should learn the history the culture of the those sites first before going to visit those places otherwise uh, swimming in puri beach and visiting konarak temple will be same thank you okay so has anybody so else anybody got any else? questions for anirban uh, sharkar or for the other speakers then i can move on to the questions uh, there is one question for uh, kasir and another one for shudipto so is shudipto with us i have a question for namrata which i'll ask at the end okay 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 so i'm asking this question to shudipto uh, this is obhirup pal who has asked this question is shudipto around uh, i can't see shudipto is shudipto around no okay i think i move on to that other question that obhirup has forgot for uh, yeah shudipto is here okay yeah okay. yes ma'am i can hear now shudipto the question for you is that that uh, in longfellow's poem the slave's dream there is also a smell of uncertain identity and displacement from his native land and then can you relate that in your uh, uh, speech referring to death is the ultimate identity and i think he is basically trying to uh, asking you to compare the transatlantic slavery experience with that of migrate is it possible for you to do that okay can i ask a question to shudipto with that sneha yes yes, yes of course you can yeah uh, uh, hmm. if shudipto could uh, uh, could connect the idea of um, or rather to place it this way uh, shudipto would you say that the idea of migration in the mind of the migrant transcends the idea of the nation would you like to comment on that Okay, ma'am. I will try to. Actually, actually, I also do have a question for Shudipto. I, 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 I don't know if that's getting burdened for him. So let let you speak for for the first two questions. Then I, if I, if I find the time, then I can move on. Okay. 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 Uh, so am I audible? So Shudipto? Mm. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes. Uh, so I will first. Address Obirupal's question, and he was referring yes. to Longfellow's poem, "The Slave's Dream." Uh, as far as I remember, the poem uh, was written somewhere between 1840s to 1850s. As you have mentioned, ma'am, mm. that it was about the transatlantic uh, slave trade. And I don't think mm, that yes. there was uncertain identity in the narrator or in the protagonist in the poem. uh okay. you find that there are lines like once more a king who strode uh things like that uh or in the final lines a broken out or a worn out fetter that the soul had broken or thrown away it was something like that as far as i remember uh so these lines uh can very well show you that there was no dearth of identity in our protagonist but yes the displacement question uh he was displaced native yes i agree to that point but here the context is completely different that a black man from his native land is being carried out overseas he had to travel overseas with his master to the white man's land to serve the white people he's bound to do that and when in his dream he gets his memories back his memories are is back uh, onto his dream it is questioning uh, his displacement not his identity i would say yeah that's it and uh, okay. then uh, i will address uh, smm's question uh, ma'am can you please repeat once again what you asked me uh, you spoke of migration and you also mm -hmm. brought in tobatek saying amitabh ghosh's books 
I was wondering if you would like to uh, comment on whether the idea of the nation becomes a kind of an unnecessary uh, appendage when they think of migration. So does the idea of migration go beyond the idea of the nation? I think the idea of nation or relating oneself to a certain national identity uh, that is always following the person. When we talk about some NRIs who are living their countries, their India, NRIs obviously, they are living in India and going to Europe or America or anywhere in the world. But at the end of the day, he identifies himself as a non-resident Indian. He joins those ceremonies, those festivals, uh, exclusively designed for Indians on Indian festivals, uh, irrespective of their religions, they participate. I have seen uh, all the concerts happen there. So I don't think that the idea of nation um, that that is erased when one move out or when one migrates, both legally or illegally, the idea of nation follows him. That that remains a part of his identity. That's what I would say. Okay. So if Aditra has a question. Hmm. Yeah, actually, my question was for Shudipto. Uh, if it's okay. Yes. So, so you, you were your question. talking about yes. our, uh, models of migration and uh, you have talked about the Ravenstein model. So if you if you can just uh, channelize that whole migration part in, in the context of the gravity model, like uh, where you were talking about how it is proportional and inversely proportional. In gravity model, we have seen that it is directly proportional to product of their population and as well as it is inversely propor proportional to the distance that is separating them. Now, if you, if you uh, nullify the quantification term of distance and we, if we uh, talk it in the terms of cultural distance, so how can you just, uh, if, if it is even possible to determine the, the concept of migration and uh, the partition, post-partition migration in that, in that terms of gravity model? So post-partition migration, are you talking about uh, cultural migration or cultural displacement? No, I am talking about the cultural spaces that narrow the minimal minimalizing of the cultural spaces, like they're traveling from one space to another. Both have their own cultural identity. So hmm. when Rofi or Tipu travels from their land to uh, a foreign land, for instance, Tipu went to America. Uh, we find that in the very first chapters of the novel and Rofi uh, turns to Venice, I think, when the novel ends. So um, uh, if we study the Ravenstein's model there, uh, I have taken out only two or three points from the whole concept, right? So, but there are other points, as you have mentioned in gravity models or gravity model or in fact, Stouffer's model, Stouffer's theory on mobility was actually a ramification on the gravity model, I think. And gravity model drew from Ravenstein's laws. And there are yeah. other laws as well. There are yeah. eight of those, I think, as far as I remember. And most of them uh, can be contextualized not only in Gun Island, but in the context of post-partition migration, as you have portrayed. One point that I would like to add that uh, in Raven's, Ravenstein's laws, uh, we, we find that one point that females are more migratory than males. And one may question that how that suits here in the context of Ghana Island. I would like to say that this point talks about only migration and not shorter distance or longer distance of migration. And if we give a closer look to it, we'll find that the Shundarban women was always traveling to Kolkata for a better living. I don't know whether I have, uh, I've been able to answer Orichoda's question, but I have tried to as far uh, my capacity is concerned. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. 
So uh, there are uh, three questions, uh, two for Kasir and one for uh, Shonindu. So I will uh, just uh, refer to the question uh, that Obirupal has sent to Kasir. Uh, his question is, do you feel uh, the show that you are discussing is popular because the Ottoman culture is rich and it is not bound by any kind of banalism? Kashir, have you heard the question? Yes, ma'am. Kashir, have, have you heard the question? The question? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So this is one question. And there is another question which I will tell you. First, you respond to okay. this. OK, so, so Obirup, your question is a little vague. Uh, it would be uh, better if you rephrase it. But I would answer uh, from what I have understood from your question. So I think that through my presentation and through my words, me and Sean in the both, I am Sean in the both. I have, we have tried to show you that how every culture is rich and how in modern day as Britishers were the last dominant colonizers, they made the people of the colonies believe around the world that they have the better culture. They have the better uh, language. They have the better art. So we are following that culture in still uh, when we speak in English or when you speak uh, in a good accent, uh, people give you shabashi that, wow, uh, he, he knows so much. He speaks in English. But that is that should not be the case. And that is not the case. So through our presentation, we have tried to show you that in every culture, every culture is rich and artists throughout age and throughout in every part of the world, they have tried to show people that our culture or their culture is also rich. So you do not need to feel inferior. So I think that uh, the show become popular because not only because the Ottoman culture is rich, but, all, but also it gives a large amount of people, a many people, a sense of belonging, a culture that they can relate to. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. OK. OK. Uh, the next question is by Ishab Basu. This is to you. Is presenting Muslim culture and religion in negative light in Bollywood uh, is trying to marginalize them in real life, like the Dalits? And is there any government involvement behind such presentations? So you can also read the question. This is the question from Rishab Basu. Fernando Paul, Tapra Mayat Kuchi. This is a question, I think, uh, it's for you. Shonindu also has some questions. I will refer okay. to them. So if the question is for me. Uh, yes, it's for you. What you have yeah. asked, it's a very tricky question. And uh, a very, uh, I can say, expected question. Now, the show, Dirilis Arturul, is a conscious production by Turkey. Uh, it, it was aired and produced by TRT, which is the official uh, media house of Turkey. And coming to your question that in India, does presenting Muslim culture and religion negative light affects people? Definitely it does. Because like our body becomes what we eat, our thinking becomes what we read, what we see. So we think through the perspective, we think through the tunnels that we are provided. So yes, if in the tunnel, a particular thing is shown in a negative light, light, then we will see that in a negative light. And coming to the second part of your question, the government involvement, I have seen very little films and read very little number of books. So uh, I think I'm not eligible enough or knowledgeable enough to uh, justify or to uh, get a say or to comment on that, your second question. Thank you. Okay, so there's another question that Ombori Shupadhyay, one of our former students, has sent for you. This is, uh, can we really differentiate between political history and cultural history? So you can read distinctively while analyzing the history of a country. So this is also for you. Then for Shonendu, I have two more questions and one common question again for both okay, of you. Uh, thank you, Ombori, so for asking me this, this question. 
Mm. Uh, thank you, Amborisda, for asking me this question. Well, as it often happens with religion, that spirituality and religion. So spirituality is the connection between a man and God directly. But prophets or messengers in every religion or great wise men have come in history to offer them a path that in this path or through this path you can reach God. So as soon as he offers a path, he can then manipulate the path, he can then uh, build fences around it. So some political, uh, some religious dharma gurus, they kind of tweak the path according to their need. Now, the line gets blurred. So it happens with political and cultural history also. I used religion as an example. The same thing happens with political and cultural history also. And politics is a prominent part of any culture. So I don't think you can really differentiate two things entirely. I would say that two things are interwoven with each other and they complement each other rather than posing a uh, contrast. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now to Sean Nendu. Uh, Ambarish also has another question for you, which you can read as our Muslim outsiders in yeah yeah so i think this is i think one of the most interesting questions that i can be asked uh, i was I mean, i'm very glad that you have asked me this question because uh, there is a no common notion that as i have also mentioned in my uh, ppt that bunkim is somewhat kind of a uh, hindu chauvinist or uh, anti muslim but you need to understand the context that uh, when bunkim is writing his novels like ananda mota or achinga shitara all all these novels are historical novels so when Womkim is thinking of history, uh, he is trying to, as I have said, he is trying to reinvigorate the Hindu culture. And it is not that he has invented on his own, because it is in the British historiography. The British historiography was that, that during, after the invasion of Muslims, uh, the medieval time of India, it was a dark age. Previous, uh, before that time, the age was classical. Uh, classical age of Hinduism, that is the Aryan, uh, during the Aryan civilization. So, Bonkim is trying to e reinvigorate that past. And when he's talking about past, he is particularly mentioning about Hindus. But if you read uh, Bonkodesh uh, Krishok, there he, has, there he has particularly mentioned that he is talking about not only Hindu, uh, uh, Hindu uh, peasants, he is also talking about Muslim peasants. Even in uh, the song Bande Mataram, which is labeled as a Hindu song, there you will find that seven million hands. So when he is referring to seven million hands, it is both of Hindus and Muslims. So I would like to say that when Bonkim is thinking about the past, he is definitely talking about Hinduism. And as he is known as a uh, Hindu revivalist, so he is talking of that. But when he is considering the present, when he is talking about the present issues, he is definitely considering both Hindus and Muslims. And there is a paper I have forgotten that uh, by whom it was written. Uh, I just read it a few days back. Uh, there it was written that uh, in Bomkim's imagination, there were two kinds of Muslims. One who were indigenized, like those who think India, Bangladesh to be their own land. And there were another kind of Muslims who thought, uh, like who considers themselves as invaders. So they thought that they are invading and they will loot the uh, money. So definitely. Uh, in Anandamot, the Nobab, the Nobab is that kind of inverter kind of a uh, appearance we can have. But in Bangladesh, Kishok, and even uh, in the uh, in the epilogue of uh, Rat Shingo, we find that he is saying that I am not Bumkim particularly uh, pointing out uh, in the uh, epilogue of Rat Shingo that I am. It is not something that I am writing against Muslims, and it has a political definitely agenda. Uh, to revive the Hindu past. So I think I have answered your question. Okay. Shilajit also has another question for you. Shilajit's question is, how far uh, Bonkim's attempt to reinvigorate the Hindu nationalistic zeal was successful in the course of history as la later scholars like Tagore and Sharad Chandra, they depended on a more secularist view. So your yeah. So, 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 as, so, as I have, so as I have said that, yeah, so Shalita, thank you for the question. And as I have said that 
the question of secularism comes become uh, because when Rabindranath Shorchandra is writing, he he is writing about the present. Even when Bonkim is writing about the present, I'm again repeating, when Bonkim is writing about the present, he is considering both Hindus and Muslims. Okay. Uh, and as you have said, the secularist narrative or the, the, the question that comes whether uh, it is something uh, linked to uh, like Hindu ideology or that kind of thing, like the, the, what secularism comes from that, that whether Bonkim was a Hindu chauvinist or Hindu uh, extremist. We need to understand that we are now considering history after 140 years. Boom Kim has no clue that what, what what is going to happen in next 50 years or 60 years time. And now we are considering it after 140 years. Considering all the political movements in India and all the political things that have happened and the ideologies that are prevailing. So if we consider all these things and then go back to Boom Kim and say, you are extremist, you are chauvinist. I think we need to contextualize the text uh, all of his writings in a particular proper manner. If we contextualize it, I'm again saying that context is important, that in which context he has written. If we contextualize the text, I think there will be very less scope of you thinking, because whenever I, when I was uh, reading uh, Anandamad, I also had the same view that it is anti-Muslim. It cannot be anything other than that. It is anti-Muslim. It has to be anti-Muslim. So Bunkim is also anti-Muslim. But so when I have spent I like 15... Yes, sir. yes, sir. Carry on, carry on, carry on. Devanjan also has a question for both yeah, of them. There is, there is one okay. point that I would like to mention, and something that I, you know, also mentioned when I, I taught Anandamot to you that Bonkin did not want to offend the government, the British government. He himself was working under them. So, you know, he was taking it in past, like his immediate, he has considered the effete Muslim Nawab to be, to be his immediate target. But he says, I mean, Shotananda says that mm. this is only one part of the larger battle that they were fighting and the ultimate, uh, one has to prepare for that battle. So this is one step and then the, the la this is a kind of a preparation for the larger battle. So, and, and, and the way he was kind of using different Hindu icons, it was also uh, quite, you know, uh, I mean, quite, quite effective. In kind of hoodwinking the British people, this book was not proscribed. But whereas when we know that Pathet Dabi was proscribed, this book was not proscribed because they thought it was actually mm. about Kali worship, not not a very nationalist text in the sense. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Devanjan has a question. He was one of our earlier students. Uh, he for both of you, can you to comment on how religious faith has been used by both these texts in recreating historical pasts? And does these two texts present some secular vision as well? So this is his question. For both Kasir and Shornand. Okay, so I, I, I so have you way. heard the question? Yeah. So, yes, yes, yes. So I'm going first. Uh, okay, so when it comes to faith, yes, Anandamot is uh, all about faith. It is all about regaining the faith, the faith that we all have lost. Uh, like that con in that contemporary time that I have said that uh, British uh, British have had propagated their own kind of a narrative uh, that Bengal is uh, effeminate, uh, they are not manly enough, they cannot fight back. Uh, so yes, so uh, in Anandamot, there is, uh, everything is about faith and uh, br bringing back that old time. So there has uh, definitely scope for faith. In, particularly in Anandamot, is there any scope for uh, secularism? I will say no. There is no scope for secularism. According to my reading, there is no scope for secularism in Andamot because that is not the text what, what it is meant for. And as I have said, that it is a historical text. And you cannot you cannot simply uh, think that uh, yeah, Hindu sannyasi, like Satyananda, all these are Hindu sannyasis. So how can they be like seculars? Because they are Hindu sannyasis. They have to say Bonde Mataram in their own context. We cannot expect them to be seculars because they are Hindus and they are Hindu sannyasis and they are propagating Hinduism. So definitely there is no scope for Hinduism, partic uh, sorry, there is no scope for secularism, particularly in Anandama, in that text. Yes. Continuing with Shonendu, I think religion is a very fundamental part of every society. And uh, your second part of the question that, is it secular also? So I would uh, use a FB comment, uh, which is a very cliche that, a no comment is also a comment and a quite strong one. So if you say that 
a secular view the secular view is also a kind of religion it is not any religion but that blank space also some a space it is not empty so and but in the text the release uh, in the tv series the release arthur arthur rule we can clearly see that there is a strong muslim uh, base or everything they breathe islam so no there is no uh, secular view i hope that answers the question Okay. Sneha, may, I, may I refer one book, uh, one document to uh, Kasir and uh, is yes. Please, ma'am. Yes, of please, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes. Since Kasir, Shonindu, Kasir, and you, uh, since both of you are talking about the making and the remaking of history, I would ask you to take a look at uh, the other source, which also Bhumkim is supposed to have used, a source in Lal Gola. Where he was hiding, not hiding, but where he was staying for some time when the political situation in uh, mainstream Bengal got a little too hot, hot for him. And there, the kind of statues that he saw, the broken ruins that he saw, from where also he uh, sourced these ideas of Maja Chilen, Maja Huechen, Bande Matram, etc. It will just give you another idea of how an even older history. Was remade by Bonkim, just as we are rereading Bonkim right now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. I have a question for Namrata. Is Namrata there? Hmm. Is Namrata with us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Namrata. Uh, you are talking about sustaining the history of Park Street, but you focused only on the symmetry of parks. Is the are you using it as part for the whole? Or your focus was meant to be on the symmetry. No, uh, my focus was meant to be on the symmetry because of this particular text. Um, you know, with Park Street and uh, with very many more literary texts and all, I we could definitely expand on this. But for, because I took up this text, so it was solely on South Park Street symmetry. On the symmetry. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, Shri has a question. Uh, Namrata, thank you for a very, very well done paper. That was a very, thank very you. interesting paper. I wanted to know if this uh, this very uh, careful selection of a few graves, which would be preserved, which you spoke about, uh, did the archaeological uh, society give any reason for what which graves they were choosing and which graves they were not? Was there any reason specified in the document? Uh, Ma'am, as far as I have read, I'm sure uh, I have to update myself as well. But as far as I have read, um, they were important figures in the colonial administration. So uh, in, the, in, in the South Park Street Cemetery, there are graves which uh, goes over a selection of people, like um, even people who were not prominent in, in the administration per se, or even uh, with regards to their profession. So I guess those were the ones which were neglected. So which was important for history, like uh, if this was a historical uh, political archive we were talking about. So something that would interest and solidify the ruling class with whichever narrative they wanted to present. So I guess that was the basis of the selection. Right. Thank you. So, yeah. And I think Thomas Godwin also comes I have one observation. Audience. Like, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, let me tell you one thing that uh, one of Dickens's sons, he was initially, uh, he came to serve the East India Company. He was his second son, he was Walter Dickens. And he died uh, in Bengal, uh, in Calcutta. And there he was buried initially in the Bhavanipur Cemetery. And then his grave was shifted to the Spark Street Cemetery. So that was because of Dickens being the remote reference. So there has been a novel called uh, The Last Dickens by Matthew Pearl. Uh, which was published in 2009, and it refers explicitly uh, to uh, Walter Dickens. So you can also look that up uh, when you are working on the past. Sure, sure. sure ma'am, I, I will. OK. Yes. OK, so I think uh, now I request uh, Professor Chakraborty to give the formal vote of thanks. Yes. Now, as, as we have seen that we are really having a thundering, you know, uh, uh, session with so many questions pouring in. Can you hear me? Yes, Can yes, you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, now it's time for the formal vote of thanks. I'm missing Shoma because he was about to give this vote of thanks, but he's uh, unable to join us because of a medical 
emergency at home. So I'm doing the needful. Uh, we definitely had a very enjoyable and thought-provoking evening, uh, needless to say. Uh, I'm grateful to my colleague, Dr. Norevan Shortcut from the Department of Commerce and Management of West Bengal State University for bringing to us the concept of dark tourism and its value in sustaining the historical memory of unsavory past incidents. Uh, I would like to thank Ramrita Chaudhuri, Shudipto, Shonendu, Kasi for their enthusiastic participation and highly commendable contribution to today's discussion. Uh, I'm grateful to my colleagues at the department for their cooperation. Uh, we are always thankful to our dedicated technical support team of CSGCM, Oritro, Akash, Shudipto, Shirajit, and Audrija. A special note of thanks is due to Oritro, who has reorganized the whole event on StreamYard as Google is down for the past few days. Our heartfelt thanks are always reserved for our audience whose support is invaluable for running any program. I would end this vote of thanks with an appeal to the viewers to join the Facebook page of the Center for Future Updates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. So yes. now we end this so, session. Yeah. yeah. Thank you and goodbye.